good afternoon uh, all uh, speakers uh, who are present here now dr toke sir dr yenge sir dr popre sir dr uh, again the madam was also there uh, and uh, all our delegates i uh, welcome you all for this uh, webinar on asthma management so uh, today is the 3rd uh, may it is a world asthma day and which is held to raise awareness of uh, asthma worldwide although asthma cannot be cured it is possible to uh, reduce and prevent attacks and exacerbations so global Inici initiative for asthma that is gina has chosen closing gaps in asthma care as the theme for uh, this year so let us learn more about uh, asthma from our eminent speakers so uh, now with this uh, introduction i will uh, do few announcements of the future programs of ima pune so uh, on 8 uh, may we are having a cme on uh, diabetes update uh, that is a full day uh, webinar full day cme with two mmc points and again on uh, 19th may we are having a uh, hypertension uh, what's new uh, that is uh, on the occasion of uh, hypertension world hypertension day which is to be which is on uh, 17th of may then uh, from uh, 29 may our foundation day uh, celebration will start at, at uh, in the morning at 7 o'clock we are having foundation day run and walk and in the evening we are having orchestra and which is free for all and uh, on 31st of may we will be having celebration in ima house uh, of uh, this uh, uh, foundation day which, uh, which is on the 31st of may and 5th june we are having various competitions, art exhibition and Vividha Guna Darshan, that is a Rangaran Karyakram, that is for all members and, fam and their family members. So it is open to all. And the other thing we have to tell that on th uh, 29 May, we will be having one uh, uh, full day uh, uh, CME on, so it is, a, it is a World Tobacco Day, so we will be arranging that CME. So no, again, uh, it will be there on uh, 29 May. So with this uh, in, uh, introduction, I will uh, hand over the mic to our uh, presi uh, president, Dr. Minakshi Deshpande, madam. So I request uh, Dr. Minakshi Deshpande, madam, to give her speech. Uh, thank you, Dr. Alka. And I welcome you all for this uh, CME webinar today. Pahila Pratham Akshatrutya Acha Sarvana Manapasun Shubhecha. Sade Tin Shubha Murta Anpe Ki Haa Ek Sundar Murta Hai. आणि माझ्या कडून तुम्हा सर्वांना आयएमए कडून तुम्हा सर्वांना अक्षतृतीयाच्या खूप खूप शुभेच्छा अस्थमा हॅज बीन अ वर्ल्ड वाइड प्रॉब्लेम एंड एज डॉक्टर अलका हॅज टोल्ड जीना हॅज चोजन द थीम एज क्लोजिंग द गॅप्स इन अस्थमा केअर एज द थीम फॉर 2022 वर्ल्ड अस्थमा डे now, वर्ल्ड अस्थमा डेज आर युजुअली हेल्ड ऑन द फर्स्ट ट्यूजडेज ऑफ मे of each year. So each year, Gina chooses a theme and coordinates the preparation and distribution of the World Asthma Day materials and resources. Gina also maintains the World Asthma Day internet headquarters where materials and resources are posted for downloading. But implementation recommendation based on scientific evidence across the globe are all applicable globally. And so global recommendations may not be applicable locally. And that is the point where we get the gaps in the asthma care. So what are the current gaps in the asthma care? I think all, all our speakers will enumerate and um, elaborate on that. The first gaps they have said is equal access to diagnosis and treatment of medicine between the care between different socioeconomic, ethnic and age groups, between the wealthy and poorer communities and the countries, in communication and education provided for the people with asthma, quality of asthma care differs. In the asthma knowledge and asthma awareness, there is a difference between the knowledge between the healthcare providers. In prioritization between the asthma and other long-term conditions, between prescribing the inhalers and non -monitor and the monitoring adherence and the ability to use these devices, then the existence for the general publics and the healthcare <coughs> professionals' awareness and the understanding that asthma, asthma is a chronic and not an acute disease. 
between the scientific evidence and actual delivery for care of the people with asthma so these are the gaps which the world health organization has put up on the net site for, for the world asthma day today and i hope all the speakers will elaborate on this how to uh, cover these gaps in the local for the, for our local population and i am very much thankful to sipla who has taken the initiative and accepted our proposal to conduct this webinar on occasion of world asthma day today for ima pune so thank you sipla thank you all the speakers and thank you for the delegates also who have actually registered in very large numbers and i'm sure they'll keep on joining so we'll continue with the program as planned over to secretary dr alka yes thank you madam so today uh, we are starting with uh, the uh, with the lecture of dr uh, dr saheb rao toke uh, and it is on asthma management i think uh, our ima pune knows dr so, uh, saheb rao toke uh, i'll be introducing him in a very short uh, he is a, a post graduate in respiratory diseases he has done dnb from apollo hospitals uh chennai and he has a lot of experience of this all these uh, eight years he has worked uh, in uh, residency in micu at saint philomena's hospital bangalore then he has worked in uh, department of respiratory medicine apollo hospital chennai uh, he has worked in santosham chest hospital egmore chennai then again he has worked in the department of pulmonary medicine chandigarh and he has worked as ccu registrar in department of critical care medicine apollo hospitals chennai so he has attended many webinar many uh, cmes and conferences uh, and uh, he has received uh, two awards and i'll be just mentioning you the awards he has got second prize in uh, ebus uh, that is uh, us workshop pulmon uh, pulmonology quiz apollo hospitals chennai in april 2011 and he has got second prize in south india zone uh, pg cme pulmo quiz srs mc porur chennai in uh, july 2011 so and he is uh, got very nice hobbies reading swimming and keen interest in yoga and meditation so sir you will be joining in our uh, you, um, uh, this uh, foundation day run or walk whatever you feel like so we i will be expecting you here, there so with this introduction i will uh, uh, call upon uh, mr uh, dr uh, saibra doke for his uh, toke for his lecture thank you sir the surname <laughs> sir tumhi chalu kara no problem yes ma'am please my slides are visible yes sir Uh, my sir, slides are moving, ma'am. Uh, yes, sir. Yeah. No, no. Uh, you. Acha. Yeah, yeah. Yes, sir. They are moving. You can start, sir. First of all, uh, uh, good afternoon to all uh, IMA Pune members and uh, office bearers, as well as. Uh, i would like to thank i am a pune and uh, uh, sipla for inviting me for this uh, today's uh, lecture or discussion on this asthma management and uh, actually other talks are also there regarding asthma management jina so there will be some overlap between my talk and uh, some other speakers talk also so i think we have to bear that one and uh, thank you uh, alka madam for your kind introduction and actually uh, inviting me for this today session is part of being in i, I am actually member of this uh, pcmc uh, uh, ima and uh, my basic work or practice is in pcmc area so thank you for inviting me so uh, we, we are going to discuss regarding asthma management according to gina 2021 guidelines every year gina guidelines will be changing and we are going to discuss regarding this 2021 guidelines and how to manage asthmatics uh, we are going to see according to that so what is gina science committee just few words about in, uh, about this gina science committee the gina science committee was established in 2002 to review 
published research on asthma management and prevention to evaluate the impact of this research on recommendation in gina documents and so just provide to e full screen dr saheb rao yes ma'am screen yeah uh, it's not happening madam no no you have to okay okay full screen is not coming uh, initially it came actually when we tried uh, Piyush, okay. Piyush, just tell sir uh, how to make the screen full screen. It's okay, ma'am. Let him continue now. Ah. Uh -huh. okay. okay. Thank you. Thank you. So, and to provide the uh, yearly update to these documents. So, process for update and revision of the Zina reports. The Zina processes for the review of the evidence and development of recommendations for. Zina reports, including handling of conflicts of interest, then were uh, which were reviewed by the science science committee and approved by the board in the September two thousand eighteen. So, a uh, few words uh, regarding Zina. It is actually global initiative for asthma. That is uh, long form of Zina. It was established in nineteen ninety three and works with healthcare professionals and public health officials around the world. And aims to reduce asthma prevalence, morbidity, and mortality due to the asthma. So, coming towards first and foremost, uh, a very important uh, uh, definition of asthma by Zina. What Zina says regarding asthma, how they are defining the asthma that we have to. Asthma is a heterogeneous disease which is characterized by chronic airway inflammation, causing symptoms such as wheezing, shortness of breath, chest tightness, and cough. Which cough will be predominantly dry, associated with very much sticky sputum, and patient will be telling us that uh, that cough uh, is coming, but we I am not able to bring it out. So that will be very much sticky sputum or cough uh, with uh, sticky sputum. Symptoms vary in frequency and intensity together with uh, together with variable expiratory airflow obstruction or limitation. So, what are the phenotypes of asthma? Different phenotypes of asthma. Uh, they have been identified and they have been labeled. And there is a little changes in the management also according to the different phenotypes. Most common phenotypes. There are a lot of phenotypes, but most common, which is which are very much important in our day-to-day -day practice. One is first and foremost is allergic asthma, non-allergic asthma, then adult. Onset or late onset asthma and asthma with fixed airway limitation and asthma with obesity. So, how to diagnose the asthma according to Zina? We are going to see that one. Diagnosis of asthma depend on the uh, defining features like history of respiratory symptoms, such as we have to take the history of the patient first, and that history is very very important. We have to ask regarding respiratory symptoms such as wheeze, shortness of breath, then chest tightness. Cup that vary over the period of time and in, uh, as well as intensity intensity of the cup also will vary according to time and variable uh, expiratory airflow limitation. So these are the diagnostic features of asthma: history of variable uh, variable respiratory symptoms like wheezes, shortness of breath, chest tightness, cup. Descriptors may vary between culture and by age also. Children may describe as having Heavy breathing, and in adults there will be something different. They will be describing that one. And criteria for making the diagnosis of asthma. So I mean, generally, more than one type of respiratory symptoms in adults. That is isolated cough, which is seldom due to asthma. Symptoms occur variably over the time and vary in intensity. And symptoms are often worse at night or on waking up from the sleep. Symptoms are often triggered by exercise. Lopping as well as allergens, any exposure to sudden any dust or any known allergen to that person or cold air symptoms often appear or worsen with the viral infection. So all these things we have to take into the history of that patient and we have to evaluate that patient accordingly. And what is a confirmed variable expiratory airflow limitation according to that documented excessive variability in the lung function? One or more of these uh, tests below uh, I'm going to describe you. And documented extra expiratory airflow limitation that should be there to label it as asthma. First and foremost is a positive bronchodilator reversibility test. More likely to positive if bronchodilator medication is withheld before test. That is Saba, which uh, means that is 
I'm talking about this pyrometry as well as pulmonary function test. That means in pulmonary function test, if there is positive bronchodilator response and if it is uh, whatever medications or uh, bronchodilators patient is getting previously, if they have stopped that SABA, if it should be stopped four hours prior to the test or LABA should be stopped 15 hours prior to the pulmonary function test. And so what is its uh, means description? In adults, increasing a PV1, that is force expiratory volume in first second of expiration, more than 12 percentage and 200, more than 200 ml from the baseline. If the PV1 is improving more than 12 percentage from the baseline, along with uh, means plus more than 200 ml increase in the PV1 value, uh, 10 to 15 minutes after the 200 to 400 microgram albutal or equivalent uh, salbutam or you can say increase uh, is actually uh, that is more than 15 percent and uh, more than 400 ml and in children increasing a pv1 of more than 12 percentage of the predicted there is no uh, addition of this more than 200 ml increase in the pv1 value in as uh, in case of the children then second point, uh, excessive variability in uh, twice daily peak expiratory flow over two weeks. We are monitoring this excessive variability in twice daily peak expiratory flow rate measurement. Significant increase in lung function after four weeks of anti-inflammatory treatment. In adult, average daily variation of peak expiratory flow rate will be more than 10%. If it is more than 10% we can consider or we can label it as asthma along with other clinical uh, whatever we have discussed it's not history and other symptoms and in children average daily diurnal variation of PEEP uh, more than 13% adult it is 10% and uh, in children it is more than 13% then positive ex uh, exercise challenge test in adults falling a PV1 of uh, more than 10% and more than 200 ml of uh, PV1 is, it, it is getting increased from baseline after uh, exercise that is called as positive exercise challenge stage. And in children, there is a, a fall in PV1 uh, that is more than 12% of the predicted and the fall in uh, peak expiratory flow rate more than 15 percentage after exercise uh, that is also labeled as a positive exercise challenge stage in the pediatric of children. Then fourth point is positive bronchial challenge states usually performed in the adults, not recommended in the pediatric population. What will happen in positive uh, bronchial polyps? Then we will call the positive bronchial challenge states is that all in FPV1 from baseline that is uh, equal to or more than 20 percentage with standard doses of methacholine or histamine. As all of us knows, methacholine or histamine will be used uh, for the uh, this uh, bronchial challenging test, challenge test, or that is also called as bronchoprovocation test. And in this one, if there is uh, more than 15% with standard hyperventilation or hypertonic saline or mannitol also, we can use uh, to uh, perform this test. Then last point is excessive variation in the lung function between the visits. And that is actually a glaze reliable and not recommended uh, uh, in, uh, patients to diagnose the asthma. In adults, there is variability up to more than 12% uh, and uh, 200 ml between the two visits outside, outside of the respiratory infection. And children it is more than uh, variation, if it is more than 12% uh, uh, in FPV1 or more than 15% in peak expiratory flow rate between the visits. That may include the respiratory infection also, but that is less reliable. So coming towards the diagnostic flowchart for the asthma in clinical practice, patient with respiratory symptoms, are the symptoms typical of asthma? Yes, then detailed history and examination, history and examination support asthma diagnosis. Is it supporting? Yes, then we have to go ahead with the spirometry, peak expiratory flow rate measurement with reversibility test results. Is it supporting or is it in favor of Asthma, yeah, if it is yes, then we have to label it as a bronchial asthma and we have to treat that patient as an asthmatic patient. If patient with respiratory symptoms are the symptoms typical of asthma, 
If no, then further history and test for alternative diagnosis we have to perform. And if yes, then treat for, if they are positive, then we have to treat for alternative diagnosis. So coming to us next slide, that is uh, uh, assessing a patient with asthma. We have to assess the asthma control, how is control of that patient asthma, then assess for the risk factor, then assessment of the comorbidities of that patients, which is associated with asthma and assessment of the treatment issues. We have to uh, go through all these points. How to assess for the asthma control? Uh, we have to take the history and we have to ask the patient in the past four weeks, has patient had uh, any daytime symptoms more than uh, twice a week, then uh, a reliever needed more than twice a week, uh, any night nighttime wakening due to asthma, then any activity limitations due to asthma, yes or no. If none of these in this patient's history, then it is very well controlled asthma. Then one or two of these all about symptoms just now uh, I read. Uh, so that is partially controlled, we label it as partially controlled. And three to four of these symptoms, then it is uh, uncontrolled asthma. So three main important asthma control uh, or according to control, we can differentiate asthma between well controlled, partially controlled and uncontrolled asthma. So in each and every uh, uh, this uh, control, is it well controlled or partially controlled or uncontrolled treatment will vary according to this all uh, classification. Then assessment of risk factors. What are the risk factors for the exacerbation of uh, such kind of patient? Risk factor for the developing thick stair obstruction. Risk factor for the medication side effects we have to look for. What are the risk factors for the exacerbation? We have to ask the patients as well as we should also evaluate. Uncontrolled asthma symptoms if patient is having, then comorbidities, then exposure to smoking, uh, allergen and continuous air pollution or continuous allergen exposure, continuous, continuous smoking exposure, then major socioeconomical problems or socioeconomic problems, medications, inhaled particosteroids are not fixed by patient if patient is not on inhaled particosteroids. Uh, then uh, poor adherence or poor compliance to the treatment, whatever has been incorrect inhaler technique, and then high survival, that is short acting beta 2 agonist. These are the actually risk factors for the exacerbations. Risk factor for the developing fixed air flow limitations. What are those? Those are actually preterm birth, then uh, low birth weight babies, as well as uh, greater infant weight gain, sudden increase in the infant weight. Uh, that is also one of the factor. Then lack of uh, inhaled corticosteroid treatment in asthmatic patients. Then exposure to tobacco smoke and noxious chemicals. Low APV1, that is uh, force expiratory volume uh, in first second on spirometry or TFT. Chronic mucus hypersecretion, sputum or blood eosinophilia. All these are risk factor for the development of fixed air flow limitation. Actually, Fixed air flow limitation. These patients will be like COPD patients. As all of, know, all of us are uh, aware about this COPD, actually, this is partially a non reversible air flow obstruction on spirometry. So the definition is uh, different from each one. Yeah, you can continue. Yeah, sorry, sorry. It's okay, sir. You can continue. 
so now i am able to see full screen actually that uh, slide show uh, so i have sir, one screen is not visible so we are discussing regarding yeah sir sir nahi hai sir screen atta parat Mm -hmm. I have to share the screen again. Yeah, yeah. Ah, you can't screen. see the screen. Screen is coming yeah. blank. Now? No. No. I think you stop sharing the screen and you re re share. Okay, madam. Okay, I'll do that. So, is it visible? No. no. Now you have okay. to share again. Now? Wait, wait, sir. No. Yeah, yes, sir. Yes. Now uh, we can see. You are able to see, ma'am? Yes, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. Now, now I, I have see. done full screen. Thank you, thank you. Okay. And sorry for the disturbance. No, again it has gone, sir. Just gone? Yeah. Yes, sir. Again it has gone. I will continue that previous one actually. I am doing that one. Yeah, single. No, there is no uh, slide at all. We can't see any slide. Before that, we were seeing it. This track. Now? No, sir. Ah, yes. Now, now we can see. see. Now we can see, sir. Okay, ma'am. Thank now you. Now you can continue. Continue. So, uh, what are the risk factors we have discussed regarding uh, risk factor for the exacerbation, then risk factors for the developing peak sphere for limitations we have discussed, and uh, risk factor for the medication side effects. What are the risk factor for those? Those those are having frequent uh, oral corticosteroid use, or you can say abuse also. Long term high dose or potent ICS use in uh, some patients. Then poor inhaler technique. It is also a risk factor, and the patient will get. Uh, medication side effects because of all those things. So, assess for the comorbidities. What are the comorbidities which are uh, very much associated with uh, or they have, will be contributing for the control of the asthma? It will be partial control, it will be control, well control or uh, uncontrolled. So what are those comorbidities which are contributing to these things like rhinitis, that uh, then uh, chronic rhinosinusitis, then gastroesophageal reflux disease, then obesity, uh, then obstructive sleep apnea patients, then recollection, uh, depression and anxiety is in psychiatric problem or psychiatric disorder patients. And pregnancy is also one of the comorbidity for the asthma. Then assessment of treatment issue. What are the treatment issue and what are those we have to assess that record the patient's treatment and ask about the side effects. Then check that the patient has a written asthma action plan. And ask the patient about the their uh, attitude and goals for their uh, treatment uh, for their asthma goals for the uh, their asthma. Written asthma action plan. What is this written asthma action action plan? Patients usual asthma medications, and it should include uh, when and how to increase medication and start. Uh, oral corticosteroid that is OCS and how to assess medical care if symptoms fail to respond. Respond. Then coming towards management of asthma, how to manage the asthma that is uh, important uh, means today's uh, and basic topic of uh, today's lecture. Few asthma symptoms, no sleep disturbance, no exercise limitation. Uh, if all those things are achieved, then that is called as symptom control. And we, uh, if you are going to maintain the normal lung function, then uh, prevent uh, flare ups, that is exacerbations, prevent asthma deaths. And if we are able to achieve medication avoid or uh, medication side effects, that is a risk reduction. These are the few uh, means uh, management. First is the symptom control, and second is a risk reduction, whatever risk are arising going to arise from the asthma those we are reducing by the treating the asthma so we have to target or we should achieve these goals by treating the asthmatic patients so management of asthma there are few things regarding that one one first and foremost is the general management of asthma 
then uh, asthma medication then treatment of uh, modifiable risk factors then uh, treatment of comorbidities then uh, non pharmacological therapies and strategies then follow up of such kind of patients we have to take So coming to our general management, what we have to manage in the or what we have to do in the general management of asthma, that is patient education regarding asthma, then inhaler skills we have to uh, teach to the patients and keep in mind each and every visit we have to ask the patient to carry those inhalers whatever he is on and we have to recheck re -check it in the each and every visit and if we are not taking it properly, most of the time after one or two months patient will be uh, forgetting all those inhaler techniques, they will be taking taking they will be taking it by some other ways. Whatever we have thought, they will be forgetting and they will go to some another way. So each and every time we have to recheck it and we have to correct it. Then adherence is that patient is taking proper uh, means regular doses or regular in regular frequency. Whatever you have asked to your patients, we have to check it. Then return asthma action plan. Then uh, self monitoring of symptoms and peak flow measurement with peak expiratory flow rate we have to measure and a regular medical review also we have to take. Asthma medications are of three types, like means uh, broadly they are classified with controller medications, add on controller medications, and reliever medications. Control medications like inhaled corticosteroids, then ICE that is inhaled corticosteroid and long acting beta 2 agonists that is LABA. Bronchodilator combination that is ICS plus LABA, they are most commonly used for the asthma patients nowadays. Then leukotide modifiers as well as hormones. Control uh, coming towards control medications in inhaled corticosteroids. What are the options are available with us to treat the asthmatic patients? Those are biclamethasone dipropionate, then mudesonide, then fluticasone propionate, then fluticasone poroate. Cyclosonide and tramsilin. All these are the inhaled corticosteroids or inhaled bronchodilators in ICS category for the asthmatic patients. So, coming to a slow, medium, and high doses, what are the doses we have to, uh, according to stepwise, we are going to uh, uh, learn that one uh, according to Gina, step one, step two, three, four, five. We are going to that one uh, in uh, subsequent slides. but. What are the low, medium, and high doses of inhaled corticosteroid that we have to keep in mind and just, uh, that we should uh, uh, learn? Uh, for the adult and as adolescent, beclamethasone dipropionate, low doses, 100 to 200 microgram in a day, that is in 24 hours. Medium doses of 200 to 400 microgram, and high doses of more than 400 microgram. Bodesonide, that is 200 to 400 microgram. And uh, medium is four, more than 400 to uh, 800 means 400 to 800 microgram is a, a medium dose and more than 800 microgram in a 24 hours is the, uh, this high dose for the good patient. Fluticasin, the propionate, that is 100 to 250 low, 250 to 500 medium and more than 500 microgram is the high dose of that. Um, so, High dose of fluticasone propionate. Fluticasone propionate, uh, we discussed that is regarding DPI, that is dry powder inhaler. And what about this uh, inhaler, like uh, means whatever inhaler we will be using, in that also same doses we have to give. That is uh, for low, it is 100 to 250 microgram, for medium, it is 250 to 500, and high, it is uh, more than 500 microgram in 24 hours. And tramsilon acetonide, medium, uh, low doses are. 400 to 1000 microgram in 24 hours, high do medium dose is 1000 to 2000 microgram and high dose is more than 2000 microgram in 24 hours. So ICS and uh, long acting beta 2 agonist bronchodilator combinations, uh, whatever uh, available with us or whatever available in the market or whatever uh, bought by the pharma companies, those combinations are 
बेक्लोमेटासोन प्लस फार्मेट्रोल देन बुडेसोनाट प्लस फार्मेट्रोल देन फ्लूटिकासोन प्रोप्रियानेट प्लस फार्मेट्रोल फ्लूटिकासोन प्रोप्रियानेट प्लस फार्मेट्रोल एंड फ्लूटिकासोन फ्लूएट प्लस फिलेंटरोल so these are the available combinations of ICS plus LABA current in the market. Controller medications again uh, this uh, leukotriene modifiers. What are those like Monte Lucas, Cran Lucas, Zafir Lucas, Gelatin, and Chromonones, then sodium chromoglycate, uh, then uh, nitrobromine sodium, which is actually rarely used. We will be most of the time we will be using this uh, Monte Lucas. And levocetirizine or montelukas dexamethasone combination. So, what are the add-on control medications for asthma patients? Those are long-acting anticholinergic, those are anti-IZ like omalizumab, then anti-IL-5 like uh, we are going to discuss in a subsequent slide, then anti-IL-5R, then anti-IL-4R, then systemic corticosteroids. All these are. Actually, add-on controller medications or uh, asthmatic patients. And this long act, what are those long acting anticholinergics like? We have to add these drugs in at stage uh, step four or five with uh, grade A evidence for the, the add-on these medications for the asthma control. And if patient is having history of exacerbations despite of ICS plus LABA for the means if patient is compliant as well as is very much adherent to his uh, treatment, he's taking regularly. In spite of that, if his, his asthma control is uh, partially controlled or you can say uncontrolled, then we have to add this uh, long acting anticholinergics like thiotropium bromide. Then uh, anti IZ, with, uh, which is, is being used for the with uh, severe allergic asthma, and which is uncontrolled in spite of all these uh, whatever we has we have discussed till now. All these medication, uh, they are not working for such kind of patient. We have to go ahead with anti IZ. That is a omalizuma. So what are these uh, anti-IL-5 as well as anti-IL-5 are severe, that is severe eosinophilic asthma. Uh, for those patients uh, uh, un who are uncontrolled on a high dose of uh, ICS as well as LABA, this mepolizumab and resilizumab uh, can be used, then dendralizumab, then uh, anti-IL-4 uh, R that is severe, severe eosinophilic asthma, which is uncontrolled on a high dose of ICS plus LABA are requiring maintenance dose of oral corticosteroids. That means oral steroids, if, you are, if, if your patient is requiring to control the asthmatic symptoms, we have to use this um, anti IL 4 R that is dupili tumor. Then, further addition to this uh, add on controller medications for asthma, systemic corticosteroids are there. How come those means for what are the uh, available choices with us like prednisolone, hydrocortisone, and methylprednisolone? So, coming to us, reliever medications for the asthma, those are short acting inhaled beta 2 agonist bronchodile, that is SABA, which uh, we'll be using. Salbutamol spray that is astaline and all those things, those sprays, those are actually reliever medication, those are not controller medications. And low dose ICS plus parmetrol also being used for the reliever as a reliever therapy. Uh, we are going to uh, uh, those slides also, and we are going to discuss uh, this uh, what are the points of regarding addition of this low dose ICS plus parmetrol as a reliever medication. Short acting anticholinergics also can be used for the as a purpose of uh, reliever medication. Mm, what are these uh, SABA like this? Salbutamol and Turbitol, only these two SABAs are available for reliever. Then low dose ICS plus uh, Parmetrol, those are actually Beclometasone Parmetrol combination we can use or Budesonat Parmetrol combination. Then and low short acting anticholinergics like ipratopium bromide or oxytropium bromide we can use as a reliever medication. So we have to, uh, actually we are going step by step. First we have discussed regarding the maintenance or controller medications, what, are, what should be uh, 
patient should receive on regular basis and these are the reliever medications if patient is getting in spite of all controller medications if patient is getting some asthmatic attack or suddenly is feeling breathless or chest tightness or suddenly he is having wheeze uh, and he is uh, complaining of chest tightness as well so we have to use this reliever medications uh, very short onset of action and very short duration of action also in short period patient will get relief so that is beauty of this reliever medications so coming towards uh, uh, in general management we have seen about this treatment of modifiable risk factors what are the modifiable risk factors any patients with more than one risk factor of for exacerbation including poor symptom control any patient is there what strategy we have to use or treatment strategy we have to use that we have to ensure the patient is prescribed an ics containing controller then ensure patient has a written action plan appropriate to their health literacy review patients more frequently than low risk patients this kind of patient should be reviewed frequently check inhaler technique and adherence frequency very very important then identified any uh, any modifiable risk factor then next uh, next factor or risk factor is the more than one severe exacerbation in the last year that is also risk factor for at this is actually modifiable risk factor for the asthmatics consider alternative controller regimes to reduce the exacerbation risk that is ics parmetrol maintenance and reliever regime consider stepping up treatment if no modifiable risk factors are there and identify any avoidable triggers for exacerbation we have to identify those and we have to prevent or we have to stop those uh, triggers or we have to uh, take away the patients uh, asking to take away those trigger factors from his day to day routine activities exposure to tobacco smoke if patient is getting uh, second hand smoke or is he is smoking we have to ask and we have to encourage smoking suggestion by patient family provide advice and resources as well and consider higher doses of ics that is inhaled corticosteroid if customized for the control then risk factor that is low fuv1 especially uh, less than 60 percentage of the predicted consider trial of three months treatment with high dose ics and and or two weeks ocs that is a oral corticosteroid exclude other long diseases like uh, other lung diseases uh, like we have to differentiate between asthma as well as covid also there are high six points to differentiate between asthma and covid we have to recheck again are you treating asthma or are you treating covid that we have to recheck and we have to reconsider the diagnosis in such kind of patients then refer for a expert advice if no improvement is there then obesity this is one of the risk factor for the asthma or uncontrolled or partially controlled asthma strategies for weight reduction we have to start in such patients then distinguish asthma symptoms from symptoms due to deconditioning then mechanical restriction and uh, or sleep apnea then major psychological fracture uh, psychological problems we have to arrange the mental health assessment of such kind of patient then help patient to distinguish between symptoms of anxiety and asthma provide advice provide advice about the management of panic attacks then so major socio economic problems which is one of the risk factor identify most possible to ics plus regime if patient is not compliant or non compliant to the treatment that is ics plus labo combination whatever we are prescribing we have to rethink on it and we have to identify the most cost effective ics based regime for such kind of patient to prevent the uh, i mean so to be to improve the compliance of or uh, to improve the adherence of such kind of patient with the asthma medications if patient is having any compound food allergy that is food allergy that is also one of the risk factor and appropriate food avoidance and injectable epinephrine should be kept at home of such patients in emergency they can use it and we should uh, teach them how to use it allergen exposure if these uh, sensitized consider trial of simple avoidance strategies consider cost then consider step up of the controller treatment then consider adding uh, sublingual immunotherapy in symptomatic adults with hdm sensitive patients with uh, allergic rhinitis despite ics that is despite of ics patient is not improving and provided fpv1 of this patient is more than 70 percentage of the predicted then one of the risk factor we discussed that is sputum emulsifying
we have to increase the ICS doses independent of level of the symptom control. If sputum eosinophilia is there, we have to increase the uh, ICS dose. Whatever this patient is getting, we have to uh, escalate it. So coming to us non-pharmacological. Excuse me, sir. How much time you are taking more? Because now it's uh, almost uh, 45, 50 minutes. So how much time uh, you will take still more? Uh, 10, 15 minutes, man. 10 minutes. 10 minutes? Yeah. <laughs> it was a 45 minutes lecture, sir. Other speakers also have to speak, no? Okay, I'll finish in uh, 5 minutes, man. Then. Okay, yes. sir. Okay, sir. Okay, sir. Okay, sir. Okay. Yes. Okay. Just I'm going to this uh, Gina guidelines and uh, just I'll stop here after this uh, uh, few slides. In the GINA guidelines, uh, Dr. Ashish Goel will be speaking. Okay, madam. Then I'll go to... Anything else other than GINA, you can uh, conclude, Dr. Saigra. Uh, otherwise, it will become very long. Yeah. Gina, uh, Gina, because anyway, it is going to be repetition. Yeah, and we find it very difficult to avoid some of the slides just because it has been discussed. Mm -hmm. So I think uh, if Gina is going to be covered by some other speaker, so yeah. I will stop here and I will just emphasize on the uh, this uh, whatever the correct inhaler technique as well as each and every visit we should check for the inhaler technique of that patient and we should correct it and uh, uh, we should emphasize on other risk reduction factors also whatever we have discussed so i'll stop here because of time constraints and thank you all this uh, uh, ima punya team for inviting me for two days thank you thank, so, you, uh, thank you very much uh, and sorry also for the interruption no. But uh, we are very much lack of time and it was very a uh, nice elaborative like, uh, talk on uh, management of asthma. So you have covered almost all the points. So thank you very much. There are thank no you. questions. So I'll request our president, Dr. Minakshi Deshpande to felicitate you, sir, on behalf of IMA Pune. Thank you, sir. And you. this is our token of appreciation for you. Thank you. Thank, you. thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Can come over to IMA Pune to take it anytime. <laughs> thank you. And thank you so much. It was a very elaborative talk. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. And an IMA Uparna for you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank and you. I hope you wait till the end of the session. If there are any questions, I think uh, we will ask you. Definitely. At the end of the session. I'll be here. I'll be here. No, thank, sure. you. Thank, thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Himanshu Popla, you are there? Uh, yes, madam. I'm there. Yes, sir. Sir, uh, now there is a uh, lecture by Dr. Himanshu Popule on C uh, COPD management. Uh, I'll uh, introduce Dr. Uh, Popule, sir, shortly. Uh, in short, uh, HOD and Professor, Department of Respiratory Medicine, Srimati Kashibai Navale Medical College and Hospital, Nare Pune. He is a director of Kothrur Hospital, Kothrur Pune, and is a director of Breath Easy Lung Care and Pulmonary Rehabilitation Center, Deccan Pune. And he's a visiting consultant at Sanjeevan, Shashwat, Joshi, Ratna, Oyster and Paul, and Sanjeeti Hospital. He is uh, providing respiratory services at several uh, mid-sized mid hospitals in Sihagad Road, Katras, Kothrud, and Deccan area. He has uh, uh, got uh, several national and international publications on his name. So thank you very much, sir. And uh, over to sir, uh, you, sir, Dr. Uh, Imamshu Pofre. Yes, thank, thank you very much. I hope all of you can see this slide. Uh, yes, sir. And you are able to see the upward movement also. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah. Thank yes. you very much. So uh, today is uh, World Asthma Day, but the uh, topic given to me is COPD, chronic pulmonary disease. Actually, these diseases are different. Uh, both the diseases are different, but they are coming from a sing, uh, single group called obstructive airway disease. They, uh, they are totally different 
and their treat, uh, their etiology, your pathogenesis, their treatment, overall management is also different. So my focus is going to be totally different from what Dr. Sahibrao Toke have uh, explained about asthma. So we will be uh, discussing the practical approach to management in primary care about COPD. COPD is a huge burden in India. Globally, around uh, 250 million uh, cases of COPD are there, out of which around 22% cases are in India. Almost 29% death of COPD worldwide are from India. And disability, as just said, life years, that is number of life years which we are wasting for COPD are even higher, like 35% of the total world. So, uh, as like Gina, uh, like the COPD has its own uh, uh, initiative, which is called Global Initiative for Chronic Obstructive Pulmonary Disease, Lung Disease, which is gold. And it describes COPD as a common preventable treatable disease that is characterized by persistent respiratory symptoms, airflow limitation that is due to airway or alveolar abnormality and usually caused by significant exposure to the noxious particle or gases. So this is a very broad terminology nowadays. Previously, several decades back, it was thought that COPD is caused only and only because of smoking. But nowadays, it has been proven, several trials, several uh, research papers have proven that it is not just a smoking smoker's disease. It is caused in non-smokers, especially who, exposed, who are exposed to noxious particles and gases. So, uh, if uh, when I was in MBBS, the COPD was divided into these two, chronic bronchitis, emphysema. They have different, they were uh, different terminologies. And as and when I went into post-graduation to do uh, my pulmonary medicine, they were clubbed into a single entity called COPD. But still, pathologically, they are two different entities. But as they are, their management, their uh, 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 etiology and management are almost same. So they are clubbed into only one disease entity called COPD. So if you can see on the left hand side of the slide, it is bronchitis. There is inflammation and swelling of the airways, which are narrowing the airways. And there is a thick, sticky mucus, which is blocking the airways repeatedly. Whereas on the right side of the slide, the emphysema, there is increase in the um, alveolar size. Uh, there is a swelling, then there is uh, alveoli which are hyperinflated. Uh, and then because of that, there is a difficulty in the air exchange at the level of the alveoli. So this emphysema is destruction of alveolar wall, decrease the lung elastic recoil, enlargement of the alveoli, reduces the maximum expiratory airflow. Whereas chronic bronchitis, it is a clinical terminology. It is a condition wherein there is presence of cough, sputum production for most of the days over three months for two consecutive years. So what are the risk factors? Obviously, the first and foremost risk factor is a tobacco smoke of all forms, cigarette, beedi, hookah, e-cigarettes, which are obviously banned in India now, but you can get some patients from abroad who still have the access to it. Then any other environmental tobacco smoke, even if you are not smoking, like passive smoking, exposure to biomass fuel, occupational exposure, several occupations that can cause COPD, and a very rare terminology called alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency, which is a lung and liver problem. These are the established risk factors for COPD. But what are the other possible probable risk factors which we need uh, further uh, research and study? Outdoor air pollution, like fumes of petrol, diesel, uh, the other uh, vehicular pollutions, poorly treated asthma, intrauterine growth retardation, poor nourishment, repeated lower respiratory infection during the childhood, age, male gender, lower socioeconomic status. How does the clinical progression of COPD starts? It's the exposure 
to the risk factor, whether it is a tobacco smoke, outdoor indoor pollution, which leads to chronic bronchitis or emphysema. Then impaired gas exchanges, air trapping, hyperinflation. Then the patient, once the, there is a air trapping hyperinflation, there is a progressive breathlessness. Then there becomes a exercise limitation. These exercise limitation further worsens with exacerbation, poor health-related quality of life, and decline in the lung functions. And eventually, patient goes into respiratory failure. It is either type 1, that is only hypoxic, or type 2, which is either uh, both hypoxic as well as hypercarbic respiratory failure, and eventually patient dies of COPD. COPD in this, uh, the second line, after the progressive breathlessness and exercise limitation, COPD from a uh, limited lung disease becomes a systemic disease. And it affects almost every system of the body, including cardiovascular system to psychology. How do we diagnose? Symptoms with dyspnea, chronic cough, sputum production. If you see uh, the, the signs, the patient coming to your clinic, more, uh, the COPDs have a barrel-shaped chest. Barrel means pimp. When pimp Generally, chest he entero posteriorly lahan and laterally zara moti aste. Paths uh, as to saat ya bhagati zara divide ke liye aste. Maje paths centimeter zara ka entero uh, lateral dimension uh, sorry entero posterior dimension aste. Tar lateral dimension is saat aste. Man barrel shape bante halu halu chest kacha madhe. Pimpasa goal ki ma vartola kar akar ke hela lagte. Then poor sleep breathing, low BMI. Body mass index reduces, bronchi, wheezing, tachypnea. Then use of other accessory muscles other than diaphragm and other important muscles of respiration like sternocleidomastoid. Patients start panting in front of you. It starts a, 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 a tripod position and sits like a tripod position in front of you. Pitting edema if there is a right heart failure. These are the x-rays. On the right hand side, there are two x-rays which show hyperinflation. And on the right, uh, sorry, left hand side. And on the right hand side, there is a normal X ray. Hyperinflation is a, almost a characteristic of emphysema, but not all COPDs will have hyperinflation. So, how to how is the pathway to the diagnosis? Symptoms, risk factor, spirometry. Now, this is a very, very important but very busy slide. To differentiate asthma or COPD. Asthma can occur at any age, but COPD is mostly of the mid-age or elderly people. Night awakening is very common in asthma, whereas it is not very common in COPD. Smoking is majorly yes in COPD. Cough is episodic in asthma. Airway limitations are reversible in asthma, whereas they are partly or not fully reversible. Eosinophils are common in asthma, whereas in COPD, the neutrophils are predominant. There is a diurnal variability in asthma. First line treatment of asthma is corticosteroids, inhaled corticosteroids, whereas COPD, it is inhaled bronchodilators. As far as possible, avoid corticosteroids or inhaled corticosteroids and COPD. So that is why this table becomes very, 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 very important. So past history, family history is very common in asthma, whereas it is very less common in COPD. Often improves spontaneously. This asthma often improves spontaneously, whereas COPD needs uh, time and it progresses over a period of time. And spirometry. I will go into detail of the spirometry story. So, confirmatory test is spirometry. So, why spirometry diagnosis? To assess severity and then progress of the disease. Whether disease is progressing rapidly, we need to alter the treatment. That can also be done with the help of spirometry. There are three values. FEV1, which is the volume of the air expired forcefully in the first second of the blow. FVC, forced vital capacity. The total volume of the air that can be forcedly exhaled in one breath. 
See, it's a very uh, difficult technique to do, but uh, a good technician can get perform a good PFT from a patient. So patient has to inspire a full of it as much as patient can, and then blow it into a mouthpiece as much as forcefully as can and at to the end of the breath from where he has to take a breath back. So the entire volume of the uh, expired volume is called forced vital capacity. Whereas the maximum volume is expired in the first second. That is called as FEV1, forced expiratory volume, one second. The ratio of these two is also very, very important. These are the normal spirograms. See, if you can see a left hand, left to right, obstruction, obstructive uh, flow volume loop will be a concave inside flow volume. Whereas restrictive loop will be a con convex or sometimes a straight loop. Whereas it's a mixed loop can have both the qualities. Whereas the, on the extreme left, you can see a normal spirogram. COPD is confirmed by post bronchodilator FEV1 upon FVC less than 0 0.7. So, so spirometry is not always available. It has a limited access, needs frequent calibration. It is so called costly, but cost depends upon the patient. There are many hospitals uh, who do the spirometry at a very minimal cost. So, cost may not be a very issue. <laughs> Needs a good technician. This is a definitely thing, but we can teach many technicians and uh, rather we can utilize our other technicians like ECG. If there is a uh, crunch or there is, there is no dedicated uh, respiratory physician around, then you can teach your ECG technician how to the, do the PFT. But obviously it is a bit time consuming. It will take another, it will take 20 to 30 minutes of the patient's time and technician's time to do this PFT. So, uh, but if suppose if the PFT is not available, then you have one more interesting criteria, IPCRG. And uh, to, you can get surprised, but even I was not knowing this criteria uh, until a few days back when I started preparing this slide and Sipla helped me with this. Because this, I have not used this criteria so oftenly, but this is very, I find this criteria very useful in general practice, International Primary Care Respiratory Group COPD questionnaire. So it gives you certain numbers to uh, uh, certain numbers for the uh, questions which you can ask and you can uh, derive that this patient can have COPD or not. Like age, as the age progresses, the chances of having COPD is very high. As the BMI is very low, the chances of having COPD is very, very high. Smoking index is very important. Pack years. As the number of pack years goes up, the chances of developing COPD are very high. Then cough, phlegm, these history points, wheezing history point is very, very important to diagnose the COPD. So if you can number the points and tick mark, then you can derive uh, to a conclusion that this patient can have COPD and you can treat it even if you don't have any uh, uh, facilities of spirometry at your clinic. Approach to COPD, assessment of COPD, assessment of symptom, assessment of exacerbation risk. So if we even upon, uh, uh, sorry, mild, moderate, severe and very severe COPD is de derived upon the FEV1 value. As the FEV1 value decreases, the stage of the COPD increases. There is one, there are two important assessment symptoms, CAT questionnaire, COPD assessment test, and modified medical research council questionnaire, MMRC questionnaire. As per these two important criteria, we can divide COPD into severe ABCD type COPD, uh, mild, moderate, severe, very severe, or you can say ABCD, and then you have a treatment guideline as per the gold. This is a very important CAT questionnaire. Uh, if you're using the previous questionnaire, then it's good. But this questionnaire is uh, there to help you guide treatment of the COPD, not to just diagnose, to treat the COPD. Because as the patient's questionnaire, uh, uh, CAT questionnaire reduces, the patient is getting better. So you can reduce the treatment as per. 
uh, organizers please let me know what time what how much time i have so i am in 40 minutes uh, not uh, still but you, you are having 20 more minutes okay thank you very much so copd assessment test so this is a very uh, unique eight a score question here which is developed by some pharma uh, company and now it has been utilized worldwide to monitor copd and it is not a very big rocket science in this uh, copd assessment test mainly it is a symptoms and uh, symptom based question cough uh, if the patient have no cough and this has to be solved by patient huh? you cannot uh, take the question here and ask the question to the patient and take it write it down uh, the answers no this has to be given to the patient and patient has to solve it ta ata he english madhe ahe aple major majority of the patient marathi bolta tar yacha kay rupantaran bhashecha rupantaran sudha available ahe mala kadhis khokla yet nahi ani mi nehmi khokat asto ya don question cha madhe 1 te 5 याच्यावर रेटिंग द्यायचंय पेशंटला तर पेशंट नेहमीच खोकत असेल तर ही विल गिव्ह यू गिव्ह अ फाईव्ह रँक सो सिमिलरली फ्लम चेस्ट टाईटनेस वॉकिंग अप हिल फिलिंग ब्रेथलेस अँड डुईंग अदर ऍक्टिव्हिटीज ॲट होम अँड कॉन्फिडन्स टू लिव्ह द होम ऑन हिज ओन स्लीप अ साऊंड स्लीप अँड एनर्जी दीज आर द symptoms based symptoms which patient can tell you and they have to organize these uh, numbers as per their symptomatology and this will be decided by the patient so yachat jar ka 10 akde ale 10 cha khali jar ka cop cat score asel total score 40 markancha ahe 8 questions ahet ani pratyeki maximum 5 markacha ahe kima minimum 1 markacha ahe तर मिनिमम स्कोर पाच मार्क असू शकतात आठ मार्क असू शकतात किंवा मॅक्झिमम चाळीस असू शकतात तर दहा पेक्षा जास्त जर का ऍट स्कोर असेल तर तो थोडा जास्त सिव्हियर सीओपीडी असू शकतो द नेक्स्ट इज एम एम आर सी क्वेश्चन दिस इज अ फाईव्ह पॉईंट क्वेश्चन डिस्निया बिंग अ व्हेरी मेजर इम्पॉर्टंट सिम्टम ऑन सीओपीडी इट इज a uh, focus on dyspnea about this question so zero grade is i only get breathless with strenuous exercises kahi khup motha kaam kele taras mala dam lagto then grade 1 is i get short of breath when hurrying on the level waking uh, walking up a, a slight hill thodi shi tekdi kiwa ek chota sa jina chadayla gela tar mala dam lagto kiwa zara eka flat surface varti zara mi bhar bhar chalayla ghetla tar dam lagto हे पेशंटचे मुद्दे असू शकतात ऑन दॅट वी कॅन ग्रेड द डिस्निया ऍज वी गो एट द ग्रेड टू इज आय वॉक स्लोअर दॅन द पीपल ऑफ द सेम एज ग्रुप और आय गेट ब्रेथलेस और आय हॅव टू स्टॉप फॉर ब्रेथ वेन वॉकिंग ऑन माय ओन पेस ॲट लेवल ग्रेड थ्री इज आय स्टॉप फॉर ब्रेथ आफ्टर वॉकिंग अबाउट हंड्रेड मीटर्स अँड ग्रेड फोर इज आय एम सो ब्रेथलेस दॅट आय कॅनॉट लिव्ह माय हाऊस आय कॅन आय बिकम ब्रेथलेस वाईल ड्रेसिंग अनड्रेसिंग और दीज आर द व्हेरी डे टू डे ऍक्टिव्हिटीज आंघोळ करणे कपडे बदलणे भांग पाडणे या सगळ्या डे टू डे ऍक्टिव्हिटीज आहेत तर पेशंटला जर का सीओपीडीच्या एका प्रोग्रेसिव्ह पेशंटला जर हे पण करता येत नसेल तर दॅट बिकम्स अ ग्रेड फोर ऑर व्हेरी सिव्हियर स्टेज ऑफ द डिस्टी ओके सो सीओपीडी एक्झॅसेलिब्रेशन आर डिफाईन्ड and now we we are going to assessment of the exacerbation this cupd exacerbation are defined as an acute worsening of respiratory symptom that results in additional therapy <clears throat> classified as mild moderate severe so moderate mild will be treated with short acting bronchodilator moderate needs uh, either short acting bronchodilator along with the uh, antibiotics or oral corticosteroid severe will need hospitalization emergency room for few days or hospitalization sometimes ic low risk exacerbation 0 to 1 moderate exacerbation in last one year or zero exacerbation in last year and then high risk is more 
more than or equal to two moderate exacerbation or one severe exacerbation. Severe exacerbation is an ICU visit requiring oxygen, non-invasive ventilator or sometimes an invasive ventilator. Tar he, ata apan bagitla ki CAT score bagitla, MMRC classification bagitla, ani hospitalization sa dar kima exacerbation sa dar apan bagitla. Tacha wati he A B C D he tharla zato. Ha uzwa badu sa box if you can see A B C D. The A is low MMRC, low CAT score. And less, no exacerbation, no hospitalization, or one hospitalization which uh, exacerbation which is not leading to hospitalization. So A becomes a very mild type of COPD. As this box tells you, the B is severe COPD on clinical grounds, but it has not required any hospitalization or it has not exacerbated badly. Now go to the D. D is a very severe type of COPD, which is clinically also very severe and as well as it requires hospitalization also. The C is a very uh, uh, small quantity of patients which can go into C, which has less symptoms, but they exacerbate, exacerbate more frequently. So this is a very rare class, but it this class still exists in our clinical practice. So now coming to my last few uh, or last slides, and if time permits, we, we can take some question answers. Management of the stable COPD exacerbation. So goals, what are the goals? Relieve the symptom, improve the exercise tolerance, improve the health status. And then reduce the risk like prevent disease progression, prevent and treat exacerbation, reduce the mortality. So group A, majority of the patient visiting to your practice possibly will be group A or group B. As they progresses to group C or D, they start visiting uh, chest physicians, physicians, and they start getting hospitalized. So in general practice, the uh, number of the patients uh, in group C and group D reduces. So I will more focus on group A. So in uh, group A, the treatment is any one bronchodilator. The majority, it, it is a long acting muscarinic antagonist which can be given in group A. And commonly used drugs in group, uh, COPD are beta 2 agonists like salbutamol, uh, the short acting will be salbutamol, Turbitaline. Whereas long acting will be tiotropium, oh, sorry, uh, beta 2 agonist. I'm talking long acting will be formiterol, indicatorol, and salmeterol. Short acting anticholinergic will be hypertropium. Long acting will be tiotropium, glycopyrinine. There will be many more new drugs coming uh, in this uh, entire list, like beta. There will be new anticholinergic eumecladium is uh, going to come shortly in our practice. Possibly some uh, company must have brought now also. Then there will be some uh, inhaled steroids like beclomethazone, bodesonide, or fruticasone. Then oral drugs, methyl xanthines, theophylline, doxophylline, aminophylline. And then in that selectively for phosphodiesterase 4 inhibitor roflumilas is a drug uh, which was uh, introduced 10 years back. A very beautiful drug, but unfortunately, very less utilized in clinical practice. Then mucolytic agents like N acetylcysteine. But uh, the inhaled route of therapy overweights in early stage of COPD over all the oral bronchodilators. So, start the first line therapy will be always with the inhaled route of therapy. An effective, uh, why controlling symptom is a vital goal in COPD? Because it increases exercise capacity, effectively reduces risk exacerbation, improves the quality of life. So I'm going to focus on, uh, there are so many drugs and so many combinations uh, like Laba, La, Saba, Sama, Laba, Lama, Ultra, Laba, Ultra, Lama, and then comes the triple drug, 
combination like ICF, LABA, LAMA, inhaled corticoid. These are very standard short form nowadays. And uh, nowadays we in a uh, respiratory community have started using all these short forms only. But I will just again elaborate. SABA is short acting beta 2 receptor agonist. And SAMA is short acting muscarinic antagonist. So uh, for this group, I'm going to discuss only this one uh, molecule and then I will conclude. So SABA SAMA is a combination, no, very known combination to you is Diolin, levosalbutamol and ipratropium. Levosalbutamol is a pure, uh, 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 it binds to beta 2 receptor, causes bronchodilatation, uh, while ipratropium works on cholinergic receptors. <clears throat> Both uh, the levosalbutamol opens up the airways, whereas ipratropium prevents the bronchoconstriction, prevents the airway from closing. The ipratropium works in the central airways, like larger airways, whereas levosalbutamol works on the peripheral airways. So both the drugs working in different parts of the lung and with the different mechanism. So combination of these two drugs is very uh, a beautiful combination. Similarly, if the Saba Sama is going to work, then in long the long acting drugs are definitely going to work in the same way and in the better way rather. So I will just keep. Uh, because of the time and I, if time permits, I will like to take some uh, question answers. These are the, just the slides to uh, of some certain uh, drugs uh, and uh, some studies. So now uh, factors to consider when initiating the inhaled corticosteroid therapy. So cort the, this is a very crux, important point. Inhaled corticosteroid is a mainstream treatment for asthma, whereas ICS is to be avoided. And as the patient improves and goes down from ABCD scale towards A or B from C and D, then the ICS has to be withdrawn. The reason is there are several studies which says that constant use of ICS inhaled corticosteroid in COPD can cause uh, increased chances of developing pneumonias. So until unless the COPD is uh, eosinophilic type of COPD, we should avoid the use of inhaled corticosteroid in uh, uh, A or group A or group B COPDs. Then coming to non-pharmacological treatment, education, self-management, physical activity, and one, one very important, which I forgot to mention over here, is the removal of the noxious particle supply. Like if the patient is smoking, then ask the patient to uh, withdraw smoking, stop smoking. It's not asked. There are several things. Smoking cessation is going to be a different, uh, uh, totally different lecture. There will be five A's rather in that. So not just ask, you have to assess every time and then... Uh, uh, help the patient to stop smoking. Similarly, there will be other noxious particles like or uh, females who are working in chulas. Uh, uh, still, there have some uh, uh, patients who are working on chulas, burning some sticks and wood. Uh, they need some good support and they need to be uh, educated to stop uh, doing work in this uh, bad environment. Then some occupational uh, hazards need to be eliminated. <laughs> then physical activity, pulmonary rehabilitation program. And this is very uh, important program and very close to my heart. And uh, today, Dr. Megha Bargaji Madam is also going to talk about this program. And I'm very happy that she uh, has started a, a very well-equipped center in uh, her hospital as well. So this is a, going to be a very, very important uh, topic. Then exercise training, Self-management, education, end of life. She's our secretary, Dr. Alka Hello. Hello. Sorry, sir. Sorry, sorry. So, end of life and palliative care. We need to discuss uh, the. This is very important, which we, as Indians, possibly forget to discuss to the patient. Upon 
जेव्हा आनंदाने जगात येतो तेव्हा तेवढ्याच आनंदाने जगाच्या बाहेर जाण्याची किंवा शिकवण्याची हिंमत आपल्याला पाहिजे तर हे सांगणार डॉक्टरांच्या शिवाय अजून कोणीच असू शकत नाही सो वेन यू नो दॅट दिस पेशंट इज गोईंग टू डाय आफ्टर सम डेज द व्हेरी डिफिकल्ट टू मॅनेज सीओपीडीज ग्रुप डी सीओपीडीज हु आर फ्रिक्वेंटली गेटिंग एक्झा सेलिब्रेटेड वी नीड टू डिसाईड अँड डिस्कस द एंड ऑफ लाईफ अँड पॅलिटिव्ह केअर इश्यूज विथ द फॅमिली नॉट जस्ट विथ द फॅमिली बट विथ द पेशंट ऑल्सो so that whatever time we can we are deriving we are not gods to derive some time which the patient have left but we know they have some less time so we should discuss this time with them and then we should motivate them to do some other activities in this remaining time which they have left with so end of life and palliative care is very very important nutritional support uh, vaccination regularly you have to give flu vaccination pneumococcal vaccination there are the newer nowadays the covid vaccine is going also been added to the basket of uh, uh, vaccines in adult uh, immunization there are some other uh, old vaccines in the childhood like diphtheria vaccine uh, is been now again been promoted in the adult practice uh, but it has not been taken so widely in the chest groups also uh, and it has been discussed so but primarily three vaccines are very important flu pneumococcal and covid and oxygen therapy uh, and sometimes uh, ahead of the oxygen therapy the non invasive ventilator therapy at home are the very important non pharmacological treatment aspect of the copd and we are coming to the last slide i hope i have 2 3 minutes ah yes, yes. 2 ah, minutes so the classification of exacerbation is mild moderate severe and then uh, how to manage either if you want to manage the severe exacerbation uh, uh who is uh, severe copd already at home then give oral steroids antibiotics more, mostly amoxicillin clavulanic acid or very rarely uh, fluoroquinolone nowadays we don't use fluoroquinolone in our practice because of the threat of the uh, 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 tuberculosis co infection so avoid uh, quinolone give macrolide antibiotic then low dose oxygen therapy then yes in summary this is going to be my last slide in summary copd is most commonly seen in india it is a very morbid and mortal disease of india and we are number one in everywhere in entire world about copd in the death in disability adjusted life here uh, like morbidity and number of patients effective symptom control is a crucial uh, no, is crucial for management of copd bronchodilators are foundational therapy for copd management gold report combination of bronchodilator with different mechanism and duration of the action may increase the degree of bronchodilatation ipratropium and levosalbutam or reduces the symptom exacerbation and improves the quality of life ipratropium 80 micrograms rather than only 40 micrograms has a better uh, and prolonged uh, bronchodilatory action uh and i end over here there are many take home messages actually but i end over here and if you have any question i will try to take right away no sir there are no questions because your lecture was very explanatory and you have taken uh, really very well with all the st- steps of the management and uh, acute exacerbation everything you have taken from uh, beginning to end so it was a real uh, nice lecture sir thank you very much now thank i you, request madam. our president uh, dr minakshi deshpande to felicitate you sir kindly accept yes. a token of thanks yeah, yeah, just a minute madam i need to just come out of yes, yeah just yes. come out and start your video sir yeah 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 I'm... yeah yeah okay thank you i think you are joined on a mobile so that is why it was ha huh? yeah yeah unfortunately some uh, something happened to my laptop on the 11th hour but in spite so, of that it was a very good lecture we could hear all and see all the slides and also hear you properly so yeah. kindly accept our felicitation sir from our i am for uh, conducting a nice session today and whenever you come to i am pune please have this bouquet and a uh, uparna for you yes ma'am i will be delighted in fact yeah yeah the live cmes are now uh, important madam so yeah. i 
जे She is a MBBS MD, a respiratory medicine from B J Medical College, uh, Pune. She is currently a professor at Department of Respiratory Medicine, Bharti Medical College and Hospital, Pune. She is a nodal officer for Dot Center under NTP in Bharti Hospital. And her areas of interest are COPD, respiratory rehabilitation, TDM, and WGS in TB. So over to uh, Dr. Medha Bargaje, Madam. Madam, you can. Hello, madam. Yes. You can start video, madam. madam you can uh, share this full screen you can unmute yourself you are your voice we can't hear you I think you are unmuted, isn't it? We can't. No, we can't you. hear you, madam. Can you just unmute yourself for your audio? I think she is unmuted, but uh, we can't hear her. Your audio system has to be started. Yes, madam. Now you now you can speak. we can hear you now just just speak something no still no, it has no, gone no, now we cannot hear it was uh, it had come actually piyush can i can you help her mr piyush i'm on network seems to be down okay is she having any problem with the audio i think she can't hear us ma'am कैन वी स्टार्ट विद द नेक्स्ट लेक्चर अदरवाइज इफ शी हैविंग अ प्रॉब्लम दैट वॉज माई we'll try for one two minutes otherwise we'll go on to the next lecture dr medha bargaje madam can you open up your unmute yourself unmute yourself and open your audio system hello madam tumhi unmute kara na tumhala Yes. Now we can try to speak now. We can't hear you, madam. Madam, please speak now so that we can hear you from the audio. 
So we have talked with her actually. She is one more one more time. We'll be trying on a call. Can we go to the next speaker? We'll have, we'll come back with Dr. Medha again after the next speaker is over. Madam, Slide this day to can you uh, mute one of the device? I think you are logged in from two devices because of which there is a lot of echo. Okay, just one second. You can mute one device and you can continue from other. Uh, now, is it okay, Lakshmika? Is it okay, Lakshmika? No, ma'am. Still there is echo. No, madam. Uh, one, one more. Uh, one more. Uh, this is drawing from yeah. device. And this is laptop. This is laptop. Piyush? I'm just, uh, just reading the volume laptop. completely from the other device. Yeah, and she's showing her slides from laptop and she's talking from the mobile. That is why the echo is there. But I think she should continue because uh, how we cannot, how audio system of laptop is not working mostly properly. No, uh, just uh, mute uh, the volume on laptop. Echo will go. But she can't hear. I, I tried to call her. Mm -hmm. Medha, madam, please speak from your mobile. We cannot hear you from your laptop. Okay, I'll I'm speak from uh, mobile. Reduce the volume of your laptop completely, ma'am. Now this and is okay. The yeah. Okay, so you can start now, madam. Yeah. So, yeah. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Thanks, IMA and Sipla for giving me the opportunity to talk on pulmonary rehab. Uh, whatever I'm going to uh, discuss today is from ARS and ATS guideline. So as you all know, what is uh, pulmonary rehab? Uh, pulmonary rehab is comprehensive intervention which is done after proper patient assessment and it is in the form of exercise, nutrition, counseling and essentially many uh, people think when we discuss management uh, in form of pharmacotherapy or drugs or some kind of you know tablets. So this is in addition to pharmacotherapy non-pharmacological intervention. So important points we need to remember is, it is non-pharmacological intervention done after proper assessment of the patient. What kind of exercise patient can tolerate? How much to give? In what format uh, we can give this uh, intervention? Uh, at the same time, it has to be customized because when we started a rehab program, many general practitioners, many people started asking us, we are like video clip patwa or send some uh, guidelines so that we can teach our patients. So it is not something you can give 10 lines or 10 exercise to someone and you start teaching. First, you have to assess the patient and based on patient's condition, it has to be customized. 
uh, what all things it includes exercise training nutrition and counseling and there has to be long term adherence to this lifestyle change or health health enhancing behavior so it it has to be done in chronic respiratory diseases patient uh many times people ask what do we mean by chronic respiratory diseases uh when we say rehab jala marathit apan punarvasan mhanuya shwasanacha punarvasan so whom to give chronic so obviously you can't give this rehab to pneumonia you can't start in acute condition when patients have chronic respiratory diseases then you can start thinking of rehab so my chronic respiratory diseases manje nemko kay so very simplified ki there is structural damage how do you diagnose structural damage on radiology and if this structural damage is giving rise to functional impairment which you can diagnose on pft so if this things are present invariably patient presents with dyspnea and fatigue breathlessness आणि ज्याला आपण म्हणूया की पेशंटला थकवा येतो सो ऑब्विसली ज्याला दम लागतोय थकवा येतोय इफ पेशंट इज गोइंग टू बी ब्रेथलेस ऑल द टाइम फिलिंग वेक फटे देन देर इज गोइंग टू बी रिड्यूस मोबिलिटी अँड इट इज गोइंग टू अफेक्ट द डेली ऍक्टिव्हिटीज रोजच्या ज्या काही ऍक्टिव्हिटीज आहेत पेशंट मे नॉट बी एबल टू कॅरी आउट दोज ऍक्टिव्हिटीज सो if your patient is not going to do daily activities what are the effects so obviously the patient halla nahi there is reduced mobility there is going to be muscle deconditioning apan vaprat nahi hot muscle so tension power kami honar ahe at the same time there are going to be complications and leading to frequent hospitalizations many times these complications can be pulmonary or extra pulmonary and this complications deconditioning everything is going to affect the social life of the patient occupational life of the patient resulting in reduced quality of life so then we start discussing about pulmonary rehabilitation is in such patients so what do we exactly mean by pulmonary rehabilitation so it includes breathing techniques chest physiotherapy many times many people uh, equate rehab to physiotherapy no physiotherapy or breathing techniques is one part of rehab like we have uh, seen in first slide it is comprehensive intervention so one part of that is breathing technique or physiotherapy what is the second part it is exercise so here again we are going to depending on patient's uh, functional capacity manje nakki kay now this simplified mala vatta covid madhe everybody now knows about 6 minute walk test three even 1 minute walk test and uh, if if you are working uh, in your uh, clinic and you don't have a uh, space for 6 minute 3 minute or 1 minute to agdi apan sopya bhashet mhanuya ki patient jar 1 minute chalun ala ani pulse ox sagyana mahiti hai to tyachat to desaturate vhayla lagla to yacha artha patient cannot go ahead with his daily his or her daily activities there then based on that the physiotherapist decides what type of exercise low intensity high intensity uh, strengthening stretching endurance aerobic he veg veg types of exercise ahe that is decided by cardio respiratory physiotherapist third important part is nutrition many times patient who is very breathless cannot have proper diet that is one thing second because he is breathless he may not chew properly third misconceptions everybody is uh, have realized ki whenever a patient comes with cough or breathlessness or wheezing any any respiratory complaint the first thing he stops is you know 
की मला लिंबू किंवा मला आंबट नको किंवा मला दही नको सो अँड एव्हरीबडी इज अवेअर की लाईक व्हिटॅमिन सी इज व्हेरी इम्पॉर्टंट कर्ट और दही इज व्हेरी इम्पॉर्टंट ॲट द सेम टाइम क्रॉनिक रेस्पिरेटरी डिसिजेस द कॉमनेस्ट फंक्शन ऑफ द लंग वी हॅव ऑल लर्न इज सीओ टू एक्सक्रिशन सीओ टू एक्झलेशन इफ वी हॅव मोर कार्बोहायड्रेट्स इन अवर डायट देर इज गोइंग टू बी मोर सीओ टू प्रोडक्शन सो इन शॉर्ट न्यूट्रिशनल अवेअरनेस की काय खायचंय काय नाही खायचंय इज ऑल्सो इक्वली इम्पॉर्टंट फॉर दिस पेशंट्स अँड फोर्थ वन इज काउन्सिलिंग Why counseling is needed? Many times people say, yes, 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 cardiorespiratory physiotherapist or physiotherapist is fine because we have to teach breathing techniques, physiotherapy, exercise. Nutrition is also okay, but why counseling? We doctors are counselors, but many times we may not have enough time or we may not have uh, proper education or training in psychological counseling that can happen as a doctor we are good counselors but it requires additional training for psychological counseling this people may have anxiety issues may have uh, self as uh, low self esteem so somebody prop- with proper training has to interact with them at the same time the another common thing is uh, smoking cessation so for that also this counseling helps so when we say comprehensive intervention i'm repeating it includes breathing techniques chest physiotherapy exercise nutrition and counseling so thanks to sipla foundation for last one year we have been running a prp or pulmonary rehab uh, program in our hospital uh, which is supported by sipla foundation uh, we started during covid pandemic so obviously there was lockdown uh, patient could not come to hospital even if they were willing to uh, get enrolled and start rehab and that is how we started online rehab also so as of now we have teleconsultation at center hybrid model and we are going ahead with community based and home based rehab so what is the actual program so it is 8 weeks program but i want to say here uh, there are different school of thoughts veg veg he ahet kahi lokanche 6 weeks cha ahet kahinche 12 weeks cha ahet kahinche ट्राइंग टू फाइंड आउट की कमी वीक्स आपण करू शकतो का वॉट वी आर डुईंग इज एट वीक प्रोग्राम विच इन्क्लूड्स फिजिओथेरी प्रो फिजिओथेरपी ऑफ एक्सरसाइज ट्रेनिंग ट्वाईस अ वीक न्यूट्रिशनल असेसमेंट अँड इंटरव्हेन्शन अँड सायकोलॉजिकल असेसमेंट अँड इंटरव्हेन्शन सो आपण कुणाला पाठवू शकतो वॉट आर द इंडिकेशन्स रुटीनली खूप वेळा असं आपण म्हणतो की अरे सीओपीडीला रिहॅब हवं आहे किंवा पुनर्वसन हवं आहे किंवा आय एल डी ला हवं आहे पण सगळ्यात सोप समजायला की ज्याला डिस्निया आहे हुवेवर इज ब्रेथलेस अँड इट इज हॅम्परिंग ऑर कॉझिंग इफेक्ट ऑन डेली ऍक्टिव्हिटीज वी कॅन सेंड अ पेशंट फॉर दिस रिहॅप सो डिस्निया इज येस मेजर इंडिकेशन फटी ज्याला खूप थकवा येतोय फटीग आहे त्याला पण आपण रिहॅबला पाठवून इम्प्रुव्हमेंट बघू शकतो अनदर थिंग इज रिपीटेड हॉस्पिटलायझेशन खूप वेळा पेशंटला परत परत हॉस्पिटलमध्ये यायला लागतं दिज आर ऑल्सो पेशंट्स हु कॅन बेनिफिट फ्रॉम रिहॅब आणि एस्पेशली पोस्ट आय सी यू ऍडमिशन बिकॉज ड्युरिंग आय सी यू ऍडमिशन देर कॅन बी मसल डिकंडिशनिंग देर कॅन बी अदर प्रॉब्लेम्स ऑल्सो सायकोलॉजिकल अदरवाईज so there also patient can benefit from rehab obviously uh, i won't say patients but if our patients are having any cardiac problems arrhythmias better we discuss with cardiologist and then decide about rehab or what sort of exercise we can give 
At the same time, if patient is having psychiatric problems, cognitive problems, then it becomes difficult to give the rehab. So what are the benefits? Obviously, symptom control, reduce hospitalizations and prevent complications. And this is what is over a period of one year we have realized because the global thing they discuss is improved quality of life or productive life or life. But somehow whenever you be used to interact with the patient and you used to tell them, explain to them, quality of life chan but jema tana amala ami sangayla laglo ki are tumcha breathlessness kami hoil hospital madhe parat parat tumhi yau yena kami hoil complication mule honara kharcha kami hoil so we need to explain to the patient what do we mean by quality of life and improved quality of life so yes at bharti we are providing free of cost pulmonary rehab services to chronic respiratory patients for last one year. So this is our second year. So if anybody wants to send a patient, this is our contact number. Thanks a lot. Thank you, madam. Thank uh, you. And, yeah. Thank you, madam. Uh, very nice lecture. Any questions? And really, uh, uh, the, all these uh, asthma and COPD patients, they need rehabilitation. And yeah, Thank you very much. I will request our uh, president, madam, Dr. Minakshi Deshpande, madam, to felicitate you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Madam, can you see this? I have come yes, from sir. a different laptop. Yes. And uh, a warm uh, welcome to you also. And a very nice lecture which you have given to IMA Pune. Thank you so much. In spite of the difficulties of joining, you have given a very pro uh, elaborative lecture. Thank you so much. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, Madam. This is the Uparna for you. Yeah. We can. We can. Oh, Uparna, Uparna. Yes, yes. Uparna, Uparna. Okay. Thank you, Madam. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Now we'll go to the another lecture uh, by Dr. Ashish Goyal. Recent update in Gina guidelines, uh, 2021. Dr. Ashish Goyal is a MD chest physician. Is consulting chest physician at Jahangir Hospital, Sayadri Hospital, and Arkid Hospital, uh, Speciality Hospital, Pune. He's got private clinic at Vishrantwadi and specialist in bronchoscopy, uh, sleep disorder, and respiratory distress associated with Jahangir Research Department. So over to Dr. Ashish Goel, sir. Sir, you can start your uh, screen sharing. Just a minute. Yeah. So, this uh, slides are visible? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah, we can the so, that uh, we can see that the, the, the dance. Oh, okay. So, at the onset, uh, I am very much thankful to IMA and CIPLA for arranging this uh, uh, CME on World Asthma Day. So, I am going to start with uh, what's new in GINA 2021. Already, uh, Dr. Sahibra Toke has uh, talked about uh, this asthma management. So uh, I'm sorry if some of the slides may be repeating, but uh, we'll start with this new GINA 2021 uh, guideline. So what is new in GINA? So as uh, it has been uh, already mentioned, GINA was established by the WHO and NHLBI in 1993. It, this is to increase the awareness about the asthma, to improve the asthma prevention and management. And the GINA report is a global, global evidence-based strategy for the management of asthma. So how does uh, GINA defines the asthma? So asthma is a heterogeneous disease characterized by chronic airway inflammation. These words are very important, chronic and airway inflammation. So chronic is long-term and inflammation. So these are very important uh, things, which on the basis of these two words, we are going to decide the treatment of asthma. So if it is, as it is a chronic disease, patient needs to take long-term treatment. And as it is an inflammatory disease, patient needs to take anti-inflammatory drug. This is very important. 
the various symptoms for asthma are wheezing, then shortness of breath, chest tightness, and cough. Cough, mostly dry cough, which is more at night, is very much classical in asthma. Symptoms vary in frequency and intensity together with variable air, uh, variable air, uh, expiratory air flow limitations. So, patient can have uh, uh, wheezing because of the air flow uh, limitation. Uh, this is a very important thing which I want to emphasize now that international variation in asthma treatment compliance. This, I think this is the main uh, problem which all of us are facing, chest physician and other physician, that compliance in asthma treatment. So this is one of the uh, study where the results of the European Community Hospital Survey, there, with, uh, there they had uh, found that non-compliance is a major barrier to effective asthma treatment. The compliance of those patients who had received a medical prescription was found to be low in all countries. So it is not that we Indians are uh, not taking the regular treatment or not following the doctor's prescription. It is found median, it is 67%, but with worldwide variation, the rate ranging from 40% in the USA to 78% in Iceland. So country like USA, which is supposed to be the developed country, there also the drug compliance is very, very low. So just happen when to be diabetes, blood pressure, the patient are treatment dealer, the patient regularly apply doctor care, regular follow karto, they take regular monitor their sugar level, monitor their BP level, they follow doctor. But same thing is not happening with asthma. Even in developed countries, the compliance rate is very low. So you can imagine how much will be the compliance rate in our country. But during exacerbation, the patient rate of compliance increased to 70. It is a normal thing. The patient tends to visit to the doctor more frequently. But overall worldwide, compliance is the problem which we are also facing here. So how much is the burden of asthma? It is one of the most common chronic disease worldwide. It is one in 10. And this burden increasing day by day. Uh, as Dr. Sandeep Sarvi Chai like worldwide the uh, date due to asthma is decreasing, but in India the date due to asthma, asthma are increasing. So we are lagging much, much behind all, uh, uh, all over the world in the correct management of the asthma. Rather, we are not able to, uh, I mean, uh, give proper treatment to the patients. It is one of the major cause of school absenteeism in 50% of the children and work absenteeism in 33% of that. So, asthma is a disease of the childhood. So, if you take proper history, you will come to know that this disease has started early in the childhood. So, many of the time it is a, you will find a history in the childhood. And it is one of the major cause of work of absenteeism even in 33% of that. So, it is affecting our economy also. So, it is a causing a lot of burden toll on, uh, on the health system of the India and economy. Uh, this is what uh, one of the survey which which I uh, did when I was in Nagpur. So what we had done here, we had done the uh, school survey of 15,000 school children. In that, we had divided in, uh, this into two groups, the children of first and second standard, that is children of six to seven years, and another group is children of seven to eight standard. And we had just given them the questionnaire to all those children. So this is 30 to 14 years age, for them, we had given and the questionnaire we had asked them to solve in the school only in front of us. And there were almost 40 questions with that. And the first and second were six to seven years age. Then the questionnaire very well given them. Their parents uh, could have filled that questionnaire. So, and we had shown them certain videos also. Ki how does wheezing look, you know? I mean, what are the different types of wheezing? So that is how we had shown them. And once we got the response, uh, after collecting the data, what we had found that all, almost 11% of the patient, when we are talking about the normal school children, they are having uh, allergic rhinitis. And 5.13% patient have asthma and 4.26% have eczema. So there is a uh, interrelation or there is a link between the asthma, allergic rhinitis and eczema. So even in our day-to-day -day OPD, if you take the history, patient will tell you that I am having like wheezing, cough. With that, he is like deprecatedly mala uh, sneezing or running nose or redness of eyes. Sometimes they may complain of rash, eczema kind of. Thing. So these are the interlink. Uh, All this is the allergic disease. They are interlinked. So asthma, allergic rhinitis, and eczema. So how to diagnose the asthma? So after diagnosing patient with respiratory symptoms. So we have to see that are these symptoms are typical of asthma. If they are typical of asthma, then we need to take the detailed history and examination and uh, 
and perform spirometry and do the PEF reversibility test. And if it is positive, then you can say, diagnose that it is asthma and you have to start treating like asthma. But if a patient came to you and the first time as a asthma, it's still history like asthma, but patient is in exacerbation. Patient is having severe respiratory distress, severe wheezing. Then at that time, we may not be able to perform this spirometry or PEF. Then it is a clinical emergency. At that time, we have to start the empirical treatment with inhaled corticosteroid and short acting uh, and uh, bronchodilators. And you have to review the response after testing and do the testing after one to three months. If there are respiratory symptoms which are not very typical of asthma, then we need to take the further history and we need to do some other tests and we have to find out the alternative diagnosis and in that case treat it like that. Like uh, Dr. Himanshu just said, one of the very close diagnosis of asthma is the COPD. So many of the time it is very, very difficult to differentiate between asthma and COPD. But Dr. Himanshu Pofade just now mentioned very nicely that how to differentiate between the asthma and the CO. Because many of the times, you know, for the patient, dum uh, lak breathlessness is the main symptom, but it may be due to asthma or COPD. As a clinician, we have to differentiate it between asthma and COPD because, as he mentioned, the diagnosis will be different, uh, treatment will be different for both. So, what are the uh, general principles for the management of asthma? The long-term goals for asthma management are we have to do the risk reduction and the symptom control. To reduce the burden of the, to the patient and to reduce the risk of asthma-related deaths, exacerbation, airway damage, and medication side effects. All this factor needs to be taken into consideration while treating the asthma. The patient's own goals and preferences should also be identified. So it is a partnership between the patient and the healthcare provider which is equally important for the effective uh, management of the asthma. Training healthcare providers in communication skills may lead to increased patient satisfaction, better health outcomes, and it reduces the use of healthcare resources. So we need to train our other staff who can, because as a busy practitioner, many of the time we may not be able to give much time to the patient. Then in that case, uh, our other staff, trained staff can help them. So health literacy, should be taken into account in asthma management and education. The asthma management cycle of shared decision. So here we have to see, we have to assess, then we have to adjust and we have to review. So what we needs to be assessed. So uh, assessment of the patient with asthma includes symptom control. Then once we start the treatment, we have to see that how much is the symptom control with our initial treatment. Then what are the risk factors which can cause exacerbation and what are the other comorbid things. Patients or in case of children, parents should be asked about their goals and preferences for asthma treatment as part of shared decision making about asthma treatment options. So we need to involve the uh, patients and their relative goals. So how to assess in, if there is in the last four weeks, <coughs> uh, excuse me, if the patient had daytime symptoms more than twice per week or reliever needed more than twice per week, that is really having short acting beta token, that is uh, a solbutamol, any nighttime awakening due to asthma or any activity limitation due to asthma. Then we have to see that depending on that, we have to see it is how much control it is. If there is a daytime symptoms more than twice per week, then all the symptoms, if it is not there, then it is well controlled. If out of this one and one or two of this, then it is a partially controlled, and it is more than two, that is three or four of this, then it is an uncontrolled. So we have to see, assess that how much is the control of the asthma on our previous starting of the treatment. Then, depending on the assessment, we have to adjust the treatment. So our treatment is to prevent the asthma exacerbation and the control symptoms, which include medication. So what are the medications now? Gina now recommends that every adult and adolescent with asthma should receive inhaled corticosteroids. So there is no doubt in that. Because as we had seen in the definition, it is an inflammatory disease. So we have to give anti-inflammatory medicine. And we know that potent anti-inflammatory drug is the steroid. So inhaled uh, corticosteroid is the cornerstone of the management of all steps of asthma. So inhaled corticosteroid containing control medication to reduce the risk of serious exacerbation, even patient with infrequent symptoms. So in all stages of we have to use inhaled corticosteroids. Every patient with asthma should have a reliever inhaler or for as needed use, either low-dose ICS formator 
that is the inhaled corticosteroids plus formaterol or short acting beta coagulants in uh, next few slide we will see which one scores more that which strategy will be better that i'll explain you afterwards so treating modifiable risk factors and comorbidities again very important while treating the asthma and there are certain non pharmaceutical therapies also we need to consider so self management and risk importantly every patient should also be trained in essential skills and guided asthma self management which include asthma information we have to inform give proper information to the treatment uh, patient then we have to treat uh, we have to teach inhaler skills to the patient then uh, we have to tell them the importance of adherence of the uh, adherence to the inhaler therapy so, then retain as uh, return asthma action plan uh, for how to uh, up scale or down scale the treatment then self monitoring of the symptoms or take flow regular uh, uh, monitoring then we have to review the response that patient response should be evaluated whenever treatment is changed assess symptom assess symptom control exacerbation side effects lung function and patient satisfaction so this are so we have to you know, do all these things after starting the treatment so if you see traditionally for so many years uh, especially with general practice uh, many of the doctors feel that Uh, bronchoconstriction is the main problem in asthma but it has been proven over a period of time in many studies that bronchoconstriction is there but most important part is the asthma treatment or asthma pathophysiology is the inflammation so this is what has been changed in gina 2029 that the fundamental change has done by gina in, in asthma management for safety gina no longer recommends short acting beta agonists that is aspirin or salbutamol only treatment for step 1 in adults and adolescents this is the most important change happened from in gina 2009 this decision was based on evidence that short acting beta agonists that is salbutamol only treatment increases the risk of severe exacerbation and that adding inhaled corticosteroids significantly reduces the risk so as i mentioned ics uh, bronchodilator combination combination is very very important so what is the risk of short acting beta agonist only treatment if we use only saba treatment even for 1 to 2 weeks that is associated adverse effects like beta receptor down regulation then it decreases the bronco protection it reduces uh, it causes rebound hyper responsiveness it decreases the bronchodilator response increase allergic response and increase eosinophilic airway inflammation many of the times if you see in our day to day practice also patient na aplyala manto doctor mi pehle tu nida inhaler vaparaycho initially i used to take one or two times now even after taking three four times i am not getting that much so this is the risk of using only the short acting beta agonists so with that we have to add the inhaled corticosteroid that will reduce the risk of asthma deaths it reduces the risk of hospitalization exacerbation requiring oral corticosteroids but here also the adherence is poor particularly in patient with mild or infrequent asthma a safe and effective alternative was needed for mild asthma because many of the time symptoms are mild or infrequent then baras very patient la ka vatte i don't need any treatment doctor last two years i am not using any treatment but the same mala bara vatte thoda far challar dam lagto so all this so especially mild infrequent or mild persistent asthma patient may not be ready to take the regular treatments so it is if you see that the higher use of short acting beta agonists with the adverse clinical outcome so you can see that dispensing of more than 3 canister per year that is daily use is associated with higher higher risk of severe exacerbations dispensing of more than 12 canister per year is associated with not just higher risk but much higher risk of death also so just only use of short acting beta agonists we must uh, i mean we must, we must uh, discourage this only risk of short acting uh, only short acting beta agonists if you see the risk of mild asthma patient with apparently mild asthma are still at risk of serious adverse events that is 30 to 37% of adults with acute asthma then 16% of patient with near fatal asthma and 15 to 20% of adults dying of asthma this is because they think that they may not require long term uh, they don't require regular treatment because their symptoms are quite mild 
exacerbation triggers are unpredictable, especially with this mild asthma, like viruses, it may be viral po pollens or pollution or poor air uh, As we know, as I told, in any short, short acting bitter drug agonist has been the first line of treatment for asthma for last 50 years. Dating from an era, even when asthma is thought to be a disease of bronchoconstriction, at that time also people used to use uh, only short acting bitter drug agonist. Its role has been reinforced by rapid relief of symptoms and low cost. So as I told patient, Dr. Malatani legacy relief also, and the cost is also low. So patient also preferred that medicine. So starting treatment with short acting bitter to trains the patient to regard it as their primary asthma treatment. So many of the time, even if you change their inhaler, even if you give them the treatment of ICS plus lava combination, patient may not accept it. They th still think that that short acting bitter to agonist it is helping them more. So starting asthma treatment. So again, I am re-emphasizing uh, re that for the best outcome, ICS containing treatment should be initiated as soon as possible after the first diagnosis of asthma. So we have to use the low dose inhaled corticosteroids. It markedly reduces the asthma hospitalization and death is very effective in preventing severe exacerbation. It helps in reducing the symptom, improving the lung function, and preventing the exercise in this bronchoconstriction even in patients with mild asthma. Early treatment with low dose inhaled corticosteroids is with better lung function than if symptoms that have been present for more than two to four years. Patient not taking inhaled corticosteroids who experience a severe exacerbation have long-term lung function than those who have uh, started inhaled corticosteroids. In, even in occupational asthma, early removal from exposure and early treatment with inhaled corticosteroid increases the probability of recovery. So, in all types of asthma, inhaled corticosteroids is the mainstay of treatment. So, as we have discussed, even when asthma starts to deteriorate, patient Thank you. So, what is happening is because of the overuse of the inhaled, uh, overuse of the short acting beta 2 agonist, the and underuse of the inhaled corticosteroid, inflammation is not under, it's unchecked. So, inflammation is not been taken care of. Only the secondary part, that is the bronchoconstriction has been taken care of and inflammation keeps on increasing and sometimes it may cause, uh, it may lead to irreversible airway obstruction or irreversible airway. So as a result, asthma control remains suboptimal uh, even with fixed dose asthma treatment and reliever as well. So nearly 70% of patients are still not well controlled. So why prescribe a drug which does not provide an optimal control on asthma? Why prescribe a drug which only provides bronchodilatation without treating the inflammation? So, why not to use a drug that provides bronchodilatation and treats inflammation as well in a single inhaler that is called a smart therapy, that is single inhalational maintenance and deliver therapy. So, it is the very important to treat all our asthma patients with smart concept, that is single inhalational maintenance and deliver therapy. So before starting the control treatment, we have to see, we have to record evidence for the diagnosis of asthma. There should be a, uh, I mean, confirmed diagnosis of asthma. Then document symptom control and risk factors like smoking and all. Then we have to do the lung function whenever possible. If it is severe emergency, then we may not be able to do lung function at that time. Then you can do subsequently. Then train the patient to use inhaler correctly and check their technique and then schedule a follow-up with them. So this is what is required after initial uh, starting the thing. GINA 2021, this, if you see here, they, uh, even in step one and two, they said as needed low dose ICS for metadata, that is nil corticosteroid and the long acting beta tolerance. So here also they are not saying only shaba, uh, shaba, that is short acting beta tolerance. And in step three, low dose maintenance uh, inhaled corticosteroids for metadata plus as needed, 
ICS formatron. In step four, medium dose uh, maintenance inhaled corticosteroid formatron, and in step five, um, high dose or medium dose uh, inhaled corticosteroid formatron plus uh, add-on therapy like long uh, uh, lama, then uh, phenotype monitor, uh, phenotyping, then depending on that biologics and all. So if you see here, Gina mentions clearly that the reliever is low dose ICS formaterol and not the short acting bitter to agonist. This is the preferred approach recommended by them because it reduces the risk of severe exacerbation compared with using short acting bitter to agonist. So again, the Gina, uh, you know, most is emphasizing the use of ICS formaterol rather than only ICS. So why the reliever is low dose ICS formatted or and not the short acting beta to agonist? Because using low dose ICS formatted or as reliever reduces the risk of severe exacerbation compared with regimens with short acting beta to agonist alone. How it is used? When a patient at any treatment step has asthma symptoms, they use low dose ICS formatted or in a single reliever for symptom relief. So this is low dose ICS formatted or is for symptom relief. And as we have seen in step three, step four, then medium to uh, uh, high dose uh, inhaled corticosteroid plus lama. And this is for SOS. That is, the, this is being used as a symptom relief or this is being used as a reliever therapy. For the controller, it depends on the step, stepwise approach. Like in step three and five, patient also take ICS formator as their daily controller treatment. Together, this is called maintenance and reliever therapy. That is the SMART, the MART or uh, SMART, single maintenance and reliever therapy. So when should it not be used? ICS formatrol should not be used as the reliever in patient prescribed with different ICS lava for their control therapy. So practically, if you really ask me, there is hardly any contraindication for using the low dose ICS formatrol as the reliever therapy. Tractor, which is alternative, not very preferred mode, that is the short acting bitter. As I said, this is an alternative approach for adult and adolescent. If track one is not possible or is not preferred by a patient, with no exacerbation on their current therapy. But I still recommend we must encourage the patient, we must emphasize the patient to use the uh, low dose ICS lava combination. When it should not be used, before the same regimen with uh, short acting beta to organic liver, that is the solvitamol, consider whether the patient is likely to be adherent with the prescribed ICS containing control therapy. If they are poorly adherent, they will be at higher risk of exacerbation. So, the main thing is we should avoid using the short acting beta to agonist. So why Gina recommend ICS formatron in step two as a uh, as needed approach? So they had compared with Sabano, severe ex exacerbation reduced by about two third in a large double blind study and in an open label study in patient previously taking Sabano, as compared with maintenance low dose ICS and as needed Sabano. Severe exacerbation is non-inferior to large blind, uh, uh, non-inferior to large uh, double blind studies and superior in two open uh, level studies. So it is again the uh, low dose ICS is and as in its is not very much recommended. ICS dose is approximately 25 to 50 percent of the dose compared with ma maintenance to low dose ICS combination. Symptom, symptom control. Very small difference in ACQ, not cumulative over 12 months. Lung function, again, very small difference. Phreno, uh, uh, that is uh, very small difference, not cumulative. So even if exercise induced uh, bronchostrain, there is no significant. So ICS formator all is being used as, as needed even in step two. What are the other considerations for uh, ICS formator all in step two? Severe exacerbation can occur in mild asthma, and are often unpredictable because of viral infection, allergen exposure, and air pollution or stress. So ICS are highly effective in myelostoma, but patients are often poorly adherent. Even occasional short course of uh, oral corticosteroids are associated with increases of osteoporosis, diabetes, cataract, all this. Uh, these are the, so OCS we must try to avoid as much as possible. Even the, the short course can cause this uh, side effect. So differences on symptom control and lung function were not clinically important. Phenotyping is not needed for treatment with as needed ICS formator. So why did Gina extend as needed ICS formator to step one? So 
even in step one also we had seen that the use of ICS formaterol in step two even in step one there is no evidence for safety or efficacy of saba only treatment so as i said now if you see practically especially in our countries where we are um, in poor country patient doesn't go to the doctors and they take their medicine many of the time going to the pharmacies directly purchasing from the pharmacy without consulting the doctor so we must stop using this only uh, saba use patient with infrequent symptoms can still have cvr or fatal exacerbation of an unpredictable because of viral infection allergen exposure and air pollution or stress to an occasional course of oral corticosteroid increases the risk of severe adverse side effects then there is undoubtedly no uh, no doubt in the use of uh, maintenance and delivery therapy that is smart therapy that is combination of ics laba and step 3 and 5 smart with ics format or reduces the reduction reduces the risk of severe exacerbation compared with regimen with uh, saba reliever that is ics and uh, regular ics and ss saba compared with same dose or higher dose of ics laba in patient with history of severe exacerbation and compared with conventional best practice in broad population so undoubtedly this is the better combination even in step 4 ics response rate varies patient who is asthma is uncontrolled on um, uh, maintenance of dose therapy with low dose ics format or despite good adherence and correct nutrition technique may benefit from increasing the total dose we can in case in that case we can introduce to moderate dose and even same in step 5 also so we can use the uh, the uh, high dose or medium dose ices lava plus other uh, therapies so while starting the treatment in adults and adolescent of 12 years and more with the diagnosis of asthma so we have to first as i said we have to assess confirm the diagnosis then our uh, strategy should be to uh, control the symptom and modify uh, if there is any modifiable risk factor we have to do that then do the lung function then uh, Address for more with this. Then explain the patient about the inner techniques and adherence and the uh, patient's participation in the asthma management. So if there is a daily symptoms, waking at night once a week or more or low lung function, this is the step four or step five. Then start with medium dose ICS formatter or maintenance and reliever therapy. Track two, as I said, better to avoid this track two. So we'll focus mainly on. this ics uh, uh, formatterol combination if the symptoms on most days or waking at night once a week or more then in that case it is step 3 you can say so there is a low dose ics formatterol maintenance and delivery if symptom twice a month or more that is infrequent symptoms then we can use the as needed ics formatterol or in if there are very that is mild uh, intermittent asthma then in that case again as i said as needed low dose ics formatterol so there is undoubtedly there is uh, no debate about the role of ics formatterol in all the stages of the asthma if there is a severe asthma then in that case as i said we can use the short course of oral corticosteroid and in step 2 in mild asthma as needed ics formatterol is preferred if the patient is likely to poorly adhere with daily ics other strategy is to use the daily ics and then as needed short acting beta agonist but our uh, clinical experience is patient generally do may not be able to take daily ics so ics containing therapy is recommended even if symptoms are infrequent or it reduces the risk of severe exacerbation and need for oral corticosteroid so how to choose the drug once we had diagnosed the asthma we decided to treat the asthma then what are the factors which uh, are important to choose the drug so it depends on what kind of action we want so speed of onset if you want fast onset and short duration then in that case we can use inhal terbutaline or inhal solvitamol that is some you just want a fast and short duration action if you want slow onset and short duration then you we can use oral terbutaline or oral solvitamol which is not being used very frequently now as this to come so what is most important is as we after diagnosing asthma we want fast onset of action and longer duration option and then most important drug is the inhaled formaterol which is fast onset and longer duration if you want slow onset and longer duration 
then in that case we can use the inert solvent uh, uh, solvent inert or oral vomit so this is how we decide our bronchodilator drug or as needed drug depending on the onset of the action and the duration of the action so once we diagnose the treatment once we started the treatment and we have to review response after 2 to 3 months or according to the clinical outcomes we have to see that ongoing what is ongoing treatment and other key management issues and consider if the patient is doing well then we have to consider the step down when our system has been controlled for last 3 months so it depends on asthma control if it is we have to do the step up or the stepping down so how to step up the asthma treatment asthma is a variable condition and periodic adjustment of control treatment by clinician and or patient may be needed so sustained step up for at least 2 to 3 months if symptoms and or exacerbation persists despite 2 to 3 months of control treatment we have to assess the following issues before considering the step up that is incorrect inhaler technique which is very very important and i can say that almost more than 75% of the time it is just the inhaler technique and that is the reason patient is not uh, doing the adequate response uh, i think the next lecture by dr lakshmikant is on inhalers and devices and her techniques only so at that time we'll discuss in more detail then poor adherence then modifiable risk factors for example smoking then are symptoms due to no comorbid conditions for example allergic rhinitis or some uh, other diseases or anemia hypothyroidism other uh, comorbid conditions then we have to do the short term step up for one to two weeks by clinician or by patient if there is a written asthma plan uh, for example during viral infection or then al uh, allergen exposure day to day adjustment by the patient with as needed low dose ics for metrol for mild asthma or ics for metrol maintenance and delivery therapy this is particularly effective in reducing the severe exacerbations so we have to sometime we have to step up if the patient is not responding to our previous asthma management then how to stepping down the treatment must come is well controlled so consider the stepping down of treatment once there is a good asthma control for last 3 months and to find the lowest treatment that controls both symptoms and exacerbation and minimize the side effects so that will be our goal of asthma management so choose an appropriate time for a step down when there is no respiratory infection patient is not traveling patient uh, patient is not pregnant then these are the we have to see that appropriate time for uh, stepping down the therapy we have to assess the risk factors including history of previous exacerbations or emergency department visit and low lung function if there is a uh, exacerbation in last 3 months or emergency but within that we may not be able to immediately do the stepping down document baseline status provide a written asthma action plan monitor closely and uh, ask the patient for the regular follow up step down through available formulation to reduce the ics dose by 25 to 50% at 2 to 3 months so main purpose of stepping down uh, stepping down is to reduce the minimal possible is to do the ics dose reduction so you have to keep your patient on minimal possible dose of ic uh, corticosteroids if asthma is well controlled on low dose ics or leukotriene inhaler antagonist therapy as needed low dose ics for metrol is a step down option based on three large studies in asthma in mild asthma do not completely stop ics in adults or adolescent with asthma unless this is needed temporarily to confirm the diagnosis of asthma so ics is the main step up treatment make sure a follow up appointment is arranged so always when you are doing the specially when you are doing the stepping down then follow up is very very important so that patient should not again go into the exacerbations severe asthma uh, to avoid the confusion the definition of severe asthma has been rewarded without reference to gina steps as this have changed over time and severe asthma is asthma that remains uncontrolled despite optimized treatment with high dose inhaled corticosteroids and lava or that requires high dose ics lava to prevent it from becoming uncontrolled so this is how the severe asthma is being, uh, defined so what proportion of adults have severe asthma so 24% have high intensity treatment that is high dose ics lava or moderate dose ics lava plus oral corticosteroids out of this 24 17% are difficult to treat asthma 
they need high i mean because of their poor lead symptom control and 3.7 percent of severe asthma mm -hmm. so if it is a uh, severe uncontrolled asthma then we have to add the long acting uh, muscarinic antagonist that is the lama which is mainly being used as a copd so step five recommend for add on lama have been expanded to include combination ics laba and lama that is three drug combination if asthma is persistently uncontrolled despite ics laba combination moderate to high dose so add on try to give separate in it can be added as a separate uh, uh, anti mask uh, lama as a tiotropium or we can use triple combination if age is more than 18 years beclemethasone formaterol and glycoparinate all these combinations are available nowadays ruticasone furate valenterol and uh, umiclinidine or mometasone indacatrol and glycoparinate so three drug combination can be used if at step at step 5 uh, what happened to lung function adding long acting uh, muscarinic uh, antagonist to medium or high dose ics laba modestly improve the lung function but not symptoms in severe exacerbation in some studies add on lama modestly increases the time to severe exacerbation requiring oral corticosteroids there is a b grade evidence for that for patient with exacerbation it is important to ensure that patient receives sufficient ill corticosteroid that is at least medium dose ics laba before considering addition of the uh, long acting muscarinic antagonists so there is a very limited role of uh, lama uh, in asthma especially it is being used as a severe uh, asthma add on biologic therapy for severe type 2 asthma when assessing eligibility repeat blood eosinophil if low at first assessment then one study found that 65% patient on medium or high dose ics lama shifted their eosinophil category during 12 months follow up so we have to do the eosinophil count again and see because over a period of time their eosinophil count might uh, you know, might change additional indication for these therapies in europe and or usa have been listed so one is the uh, severe uh, type 2 asthma other indications are uh, for using the uh, biology that omelizumab chronic idiopathic aortic area or nasal polyposis then mepolizumab is used for hyper eosinophilic syndrome eosinophilic gammatosis with poly, uh, poly uh, angitis then benrizumab no additional indication only it is being used as a severe asthma then dupuliz uh, uh, dupulimab chronic rhino sinusitis and nasal polyposis atrophic dermatitis so it depends on country to country but all these drugs biologics are very well available in india although the cost is very high but they are available in india now omelizumab treatment for patients age more than 5 year with moderate or severe allergic asthma that is uncontrolled on step 4 to 5 treatment so then we have to if it is uncontrolled in step 4 and 5 then we have to consider the omelizumab omelizumab is recommended as add on for age more than 5 years given by subfit injection every 2 to 4 days with dose based on weight and the serum ige level may also be indicated for nasal polyposis and, uh, and chronic idiopathic aortic area potential predictors for good asthma response to omelizumab baseline ige level does not predict likelihood of response so it may not be the good predictor for uh, response to the omelizumab therapy in one observation study a greater decrease in exacerbation observed with blood eosinophil count more than 260 micro per liter or uh, pheno more than uh, 20 or childhood onset asthma or clinical history suggesting allergy driven symptoms so these are the uh, good predictors for response to omelizumab then add on azithromycin that is 3 days a week has been confirmed as an option for consideration after specialized referral so it is being not routinely recommended it significantly reduces the exacerbation in patients taking high dose ics laba it significantly reduces the exacerbation in patient with eosinophilic or non eosinophilic asthma in no specific evidence published for azithromycin in patients taking medium ics laba so high, it is been recommended as a add on to the high dose ics laba it acts by it has a good anti inflammatory action that is why it is being recommended so before considering add on azithromycin you have to check sputum for atypical mycobacteria and 
especially in our country, then check for ECG for prolonged uh, QTC um, uh, as being a side effect of uh, azithromycin and consider the risk of increasing the antimicrobial resistance by prolonged use of azithromycin. So this slide, Dr. Saibiro has already explained this. I have just one or two slides. Uh, Madam, we have time for two, three minutes. I think one or two slides more because the next speaker is also waiting. Yeah, just last, I think last one, two slides. So in other devices, in clinical practice, choice of device should be based on each individual patient, on assessment of symptom control, risk factors, patient preferences, and practical issues. So depending on the cost, ability to use the device in the address. Then device selection for adults, I think Dr. Lakshmikant will explain more about this in uh, next slide, uh, next talk. So what are the non-pharmacological non strategies and interventions? In addition to medication, other therapies and strategies may be considered where relevant to assist in symptom control and risk reduction. Some example with consistent high quality events are smoking cessation, and, uh, then physical activity, encourage people with asthma to engage in regular physical activity because of its general health benefit. It may have a small benefit for asthma control and lung function also. It provide, uh, provide advice about management of exercise induced bronchoconstriction. Then investigate for occupational asthma, then identify aspirin uh, or exacerbated respiratory diseases before prescribing non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, that, including aspirin that also can exert asthma sometimes and ask for about any previous reactions. This is uh, one slide about the exercise uh, into the asthma. It is always better to take two forms of reliever medication before taking any exercise if somebody is having the experience of the exercise into the asthma, like climbing the hill, visiting the shrine on uphill, etc. In case of children, the class teacher should be informed about it and should be uh, brief to help child take, uh, uh, should be brief to help the child taking the reliever medicine before undertaking any sports activity. Uh, just this is again a very important issue. Many of the times come with uh, in our detailed practice that what about the inhalers in pregnancy? So it is being found that uh, as the inhalers are very, very safe, both ICS and LABA in pregnancy. It can be taken in all the stages of pregnancy. So in fact, the need for the inhaler is more during the pregnancy. So we should not stop the inhalers during the pregnancy. So as I was saying that it is very important to uh, involve the patient also in their care um, uh, patient uh, in asthma management. So this is one study where living and breathing study where UK qualitative and quantitative study to evaluate the patient understanding of their asthma and to determine patient preferences regarding the delivery of asthma care and treatment. So patient preferences are treatment should be as simple as possible. There should be fever in there. It, is, it should not be like the one even as in smart concept, the lowest dose of steroid to control the symptom, avoid hospitalization whenever possible and minimize the symptom. So all this is possible with this smart concept that is single maintenance and the trillion. So this is my last slide. This is the message which I want to give to all of our asthmatic patients that I have asthma, but asthma doesn't have me. It means that all, although I am having asthma, it is not going to affect my day-to-day -day activities, it is not going to affect my activity then. So we should have a, that much good control of asthma that all our asthmatic patients, especially children, they should be able to do all their day-to-day -day activities. They should be able to enjoy their cold drink, ice cream. They should be able to eat. They should be able to do whatever exercise swimming they want to. So in summary, asthma cannot be cured as Madam has uh, told in the beginning only, but it can be effectively cured, uh, effectively controlled. So it is practically self-curable. You can live, patient can have an absolutely normal life as a normal person, provided patient is taking their inhalers regularly. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Ashish Goel, sir, for his detailed uh, explanation about recent updates in GINA gu uh, guidelines. I request President Dr. Minakshi Deshpande, madam, to felicitate Dr. Goel. Thank you, Goel, sir. I think there are no questions. I will be taking the questions at the end of the session, I think. Okay. So I request you to also wait till the end of the session. We'll have one more talk. And thank you very much. This is a bouquet for you. 
and yes. thank you for a very uh, well elaborated lecture and a talk and i found your talk most practical actually and uh, in, it can be put into daily day to day practice this is the uparna for you sir yes. and please come can you see it it's a... yes yes i can see thank you very much yeah 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 and uh, please come to ima pune to have a felicitation round for you also any time yes thank, thank you so much thank you thank you very much thank you goel sir Uh, now i invite uh, dr lakshmikant yenge sir for his next talk dr lakshmikant will be talking on uh, role of drugs and devices in inhalation therapy i take this opportunity to briefly introduce dr lakshmikant yenge uh, dr lakshmikant yenge sir is, uh, is a consultant in pulmonary medicine and critical care at dinanath mangeshkar hospital he has done his post graduation as well as his uh, super specialization in pulmonary and critical care medicine from pgi chandigarh so with this brief introduction uh, of dr lakshmika dinge sir uh, i invite dr lakshmika dinge sir to give a, his talk on role of drugs and devices in inhalation therapy over to you sir Dr. Lakshmikant, can you? No, I'm sorry. Lakshmikant, young sir, are you there? Yes, ma'am. I'm here. Yes. Can you hear me and can you see my presentation? Yes. Yes, Dr. Lakshmikant, we can hear you. So I request you to start your talk on role of drugs and devices in inhalation therapy. Okay. Ah, uh, so no, uh, actually I was on mute and I had actually started. So I'll start over again. Uh, so first of all i thank ima to have uh, me for this particular uh, talk on this particular important day and important issue about asthma and devices uh, and at the same time i would like to thank the audience for staying and uh, tuned till the last session uh, which apparently uh, is be uh, happens because of fatigue and because of the title of the presentation itself i was expecting that there will be significant drop out but that has not happened so they do it has started happening before that happens i'll try to make it more interesting so that others remain uh, glued to this so the topic which was assigned to me was uh, drugs and devices in inhalational therapy uh, however uh, this is something which has been discussed in great detail by three speakers before me and if i start discussing about the pharmacotherapy of asthma or copd or airway disease for that matter which i prefer to call them i think some of you will show the signs of uh, toxicity so i'll skip that and come back to the the important topic or the message which i would like to convey across and this is regarding the devices inhaler devices which one is for whom so this is something which i'll uh, try to uh, focus briefly about uh, moving ahead why why should we actually talk about the inhaler so before moving forward i would uh, request all the participants to have pen and paper along and uh, try and note down uh, some of the points which i am going to discuss and try to have their own opinion had it been an uh, offline cme i would have liked to interact with uh, everybody more but since it is online cme and it is not practically possible for all of you to participate in discussion so keep pen and paper and then keep uh, noting down and assess yourself at the end of session uh, how things uh, went differently in next 30 minutes or 20 minutes so so most of us know what works for airway disease and then oh, sorry so most of us know what works for airway disease and uh, we do prescribe correctly however it does not reach the target the reason for that lies in the subsequent slides which i'm going to cover the single most intervention i spent time upon is inhaler technique and inhaler devices and i, I insist on patients demonstrate me how they use the inhaler even if the patient happens to be a doctor some of my physician colleagues had to uh, undergo this tedious exercise of explaining the inhaler to me and believe me that most of them could not do it properly so this is so commonly misused that even the house md had one bit on it so if those of you who have seen house md i hope you would have uh, seen that particular uh, uh, episode and you will relate to it moving ahead 
making uh, keeping it interesting why inhalers why not tablet syrups or capsules doctor can you give me any of these but not inhalers uh, if you ask them they'll tell that uh, inhalers are something which can make you dependent so i don't want inhalers i would rather prefer medicines uh, in other forms uh, and then uh, they'll ask do inhalers have side effects so we'll ask these questions before we embark on to uh, how to use them properly so this is the statement i usually tend to make to the patient who is asking the question whether inhalers are better or tablets are better so if one member in family is not well do we give that particular individual the medicine or do we put the medicine in drinking water which comes in our house so the answer is pretty obvious that we'll give the medicines to an individual so similarly we'll give uh, drugs to the lungs and uh, avoid toxicity or unnecessary exposure to the other organs which conveys the first point the second point is do they make you dependent the answer is definitely yes but that definitely yes is coming out of sarcasm and not out of the facts so the sarcasm here is that it only confirms the fact that they are helpful if they were not helpful if you will not feel better after taking inhalers you may as well uh, stop using them and i would uh, in fact ask you not to use them if they are not helping so they are dependent or they will make you dependent from both the points so you will feel better and i'll insist on taking them because they are definitely helpful and then finally moving on uh, do the inhalers have side effects again the answer to this question, the particular question is that yes they do have side effects nothing is without side effects and uh, if uh, something is there without uh, effects then only it can have no side effects so even water you take in excess amount has got side effects and can lead to hyponatremia so there is practically nothing without side effect however if taken appropriately the side effects with inhalers are practically zero practically zero and there are the each word has got very very important connotation here so that is why i would repeat here so if taken appropriately inhalers have practically zero side effects okay so with this uh, i think i have made my uh, most important message so even if we have some dropouts going further i possibly would mind and that was the possible uh, the precise reason why i had kept these questions and answer at the beginning itself moving on what is the ideal inhaler which we want to have so the ideal inhaler should have all these properties so it should be effective first of all it should be reliable it should deliver the dose consistently then it should be very simple to use understand for patient as well as the caretaker it should be cheap and it should be acceptable so this this is the all these are very very important points then if you ask me what are the what is the ideal inhaler i would like to have or anybody would like to have this is the ideal inhaler we would like to have provided it is effective and does not have uh, side effects which which all of us know it has so uh, how, however unfortunately we have uh, not been able to uh, uh, develop such an ideal inhaler so far so how do we operate in an imperfect world with imperfect tools and that is what we are going to learn from the subsequent slides moving uh, to that we'll try to understand first what is uh, what are the principles which govern the inhaler therapy so what is the percentage of drug reaching the target with best available device and the best possible technique if you can note down the rough number which is uh, uh, the answer in your opinion and is attention to first to the first pass metabolism worth in inhaled drugs i'm purposefully taking you back to the first and second year uh, mbbs or second year mbbs uh, to be precise because there are some important messages over there and uh, visiting the basics is always always helpful if we want to make decisions for our patients or ourselves and if yes answer to the second question is yes then which one would you prefer the drug with high pass fast metabolism or drug with the low first pass metabolism to be considered for inhalational therapy uh, so i'll come to these answers if time permits subsequently at the end of my, uh, the presentation i would request somebody to remind me if i need to answer or if i forget to answer these questions at the end of it all these questions do have definite answers and none of the questions are just to offend anybody so moving on to the basics of drug deposition aerosol or aero 
uh, means uh, uh, aerosol means aero or air and the solution. Uh, so it nothing it is nothing but an aerosol consists of a dispersion or suspension of solid particles or liquid droplets in a carrier and the carrier here is actually a gaseous medium. So we are using gas as a medium to deliver the doses and that is nothing but we call aerosol delivery. The fine particles are defined as which are less than 5 microns. Fine particle fraction is the percentage of uh, fine particles which is there in the, uh, the uh, particles which are produced. And then the extra fine particles are the particles which are less than 2 microns. Uh, so what happens to the inhaled drugs when we give them? So this is what actually happens. Only 20% of the it actually goes to the lungs. 80% of them is either swallowed or goes to the atmosphere. So it can be helpful to the patients around you and not you. And only 20% is helpful to, to the person who is actually owning the owning and using the drug. Further, there can be systemic circulation or systemic absorption of the drugs from the lungs. And this can be used for systemic delivery of the drugs. Then finally, from the stomach, the absorbed drug goes to the liver and from liver it goes to the systemic circulation and from systemic circulation you have metabolism uh, either in the liver or the excretion and un 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 unadulterated in the kidneys and finally we have the uh, elimination from the body so this is how the drugs actually uh, travel when we give them by inhalational method Fine particles, extra fine particles, we have already gone through. Just to focus, anything more than 5 microns usually doesn't go beyond carina. Anything between 1 to 5 usually goes to the smallest airways. And less than 1 micron can go to the alveoli and can be absorbed systemically. So the systemic absorption will be highest if the size is less than 1. And the pul primary pulmonary deposition will be best if the size is 1 to 5 microns. This, this is what we have to take home from this particular slide. What are the devices available to us? This is nothing but a jigsaw puzzle for all of you. So if randomly uh, enumerated, they confuse you a lot rather than uh, uh, be of any help. So what is DPI? What is MDI? What is PMDI? What is uh, BAI? What is SMI? All these things might confuse you. I'll try to simplify them for you. So this is the universe of inhalers which are available to you. I have purposefully kept the nebulizers out of this because everybody knows about them and there is nothing much to debate about it except for few facts which I'll come to in, at the end of presentation. So these are D, various forms of DPI or dry powder inhalers. This is uh, MDI. This is MDI with digital loss counter. This is MDI with spacer. And this is a breathe actuated inhaler or inhaler, which is uh, activated by your uh, the air flows which you are generating. And finally, this is a soft mist inhaler, which is not yet available in India, but I'm expecting it will be available in India in next five years or so. So if you organize them a little bit, it becomes a little easy to understand. First one to come where? Bitter dose inhalers. Uh, there are three uh, types which can be used. Bitter dose inhalers alone, meter dose inhaler with spacer and with actuated inhalers. And then we have dry powder inhalers, which circumvent some of the disadvantages of the meter dose inhalers. And they come with their own set of disadvantages. Then there are nebulizers. And then we'll finally talk about the soft mist inhalers. So moving on to the nebulizers first, because everybody knows them. It does not require any cooperation on the part of the patient. Anybody can use. You just prescribe and you are relatively assured that the drug is delivered or the drug is reaching at the target where you intend to be. However, it comes with a lot of disadvantages. It requires external source of energy, not easily portable. So if somebody wants to travel, say, 10 kilometers, 20 kilometers, I want to go to a relative's place for one or two days they'll not be able to go without carrying their uh, uh, nebulization machine along, which may become cumbersome. And especially if somebody who is traveling very frequently or traveling by air, the weight of the machine is going to be a problem. Clearance for the machine is going to be a problem for travel. So all these issues they will have to face. Drug delivered to the eyes can lead to side effects. Less efficacious for emulsion form of the drugs, especially the steroids. It is costly. We tend to ignore this particular fact, but just to uh, 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 give you the rough figures, uh, what is the 
multiple by which the cost of therapy or cost per dose is going to be increased if we switch from other inhalers to the nebulizers. This is exercise for all the participants. And if you can note down the number, uh, I'll give you the answer. So this is one more question uh, where I would like uh, uh, somebody to remind me uh, to answer at the end of uh, uh, the presentation. And it requires maintenance, especially the newer nebulizers, which are very, very fragile. They need almost daily cleaning, which actually um, uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, takes away all the advantages of the nebulization we are discussing. And if it's something that requires very, very uh, uh, meticulous cleaning daily, uh, uh, we propose that uh, nebulization is easy for the elderly people who cannot maintain the inhalers or can maintain them properly then this is actually defying the purpose or the advantage over there. Moving on, so we need to have additional devices. So what we have is metadose inhalers. The medicine is in suspension form and it is a pressurized canister. Uh, they may be with or without those counters. We have to be very careful about this. The ones which the older generation ones come without those counters, so once they come with those count without those counters, it is very difficult for anybody to identify whether it is actually empty or full. And even I don't know. I have law. I have never learned those tricks because uh, from the time I am practicing, I am used to having the inhalers with those counters. Uh, so uh, these are the steps one must explain to the patient uh, when uh, we are prescribing the uh, medication. Just writing MDF. Uh, uh, so and so twice a day is not going to be of any use to the patient unless they have been told about all these steps. Some of the steps may be different than what are recommended in the manufacturer's guideline. However, I stick to these because I prefer patient can do only one step at a time. If you ask them to do two or more steps at any point in time, they tend to squander the procedure uh, process and then they'll not use them properly. So prepare inhaler by mixing uh, or shaking, then breathe out to the maximum, keep mouthpiece of the inhaler in mouth and close lips around it. Then actuate the inhaler and start breathing in simultaneously. This is the only step the patient uh, has to do simultaneously. Then take slow and deep breath as far as possible. When MDIs are being prescribed, the patient should not hurry on to the breath. They should breathe in slowly and as deep as possible. And then at the end of it, they have to hold the breath as long as possible, minimum five to 10 seconds. 10 seconds is what is recommended for most of the medications or the inhalers. And then after that, they don't have to forcefully breathe out. They just have to breathe out normally, normal breath. And then they continue to breathe normally for one to two minutes. Then they take the second puff. So they are not supposed to take two puffs at a time, though we are prescribing two puffs in the morning, two puffs in the evening. They have to be taken at least one minute apart because these inhalers require at least one minute of charging time to be used uh, ready for dispensing the next dose. So the patient also requires at least one to two minutes time and the inhaler also needs the rest. So both of them need the rest. So at least two minutes is the rest. I advise them uh, not to mix uh, the problem or compound the problem. And then the repeat steps one to seven for the second puff. And then finally, you have to gargle with usual water. You need not have warm water or uh, uh, medicated water, just normal tap water. The reason to say the normal tap water is that uh, either they'll skip the inhalers just because warm water was not available or they'll delay the gargle till the water gets warm or if they try to gargle with warm water, if it is excessively warm, they will have burns in the mucosa and then they'll attribute those side effects to the inhaler and then the acceptance to the inhalers will go down. So for all these reasons, they should warm, uh, gargle with uh, tap water, simple tap water. The warm water here is not required. That is by mistake. I, I have to make correction to that instruction. So what are the advantages of metadose inhaler? They are ultra portable. They can be carried anywhere without any problem. And no airline is going to question, why are you carrying this along? However, there are disadvantages. It is highly dependent on coordination. The patient has to learn to coordinate things. Uh, oropharyngeal deposition, deposition is very, very high. So obviously the side effects related to oropharyngeal deposition are high. It increases the plastic weight because every month or so they have to discard this and then this adds to the overall plastic waste on the, uh, the earth. 
so with these some of the reasons we are so with some of the disadvantages we have to have some more uh, drugs i'm pretty sure many of you can uh, enumerate many advantages and disadvantages i have to keep the presentation simple and to focus on very few points i have kept them to minimum now to and uh, avoid that advert disadvantages of this uh, uh, coordination we have as well as oropharyngeal deposition we can go for uh metadocineler with spacer so once we uh, start using metadocineler with spacer uh, uh what are the advantages of what do you, what is the structure the spacer is nothing but a holding chamber so this will allow the patient to load the drug and then take it uh, with some gap patient necessarily does not have to coordinate the both things together so actuation of the inhaler as well as breathing in both together are not required uh uh so the present there are valves present to avoid the um, uh, outflow of the drug valve as well as cap at the tip so that drug does not go away before the patient breathes in uh use of multiple actuations uh, is possible however should be avoided one actuation at a time is still recommended construction materials and the electrostatic charge is something which we have to be aware of and this is why there is something called half life of the spacer so the spacers which come may or may not come with charge those with charge do not allow the drug to deposit from the inner walls of the device so they actually improve the uh, delivery and uh, decrease the wastage of the drug with each dose and as the time passes the particular electrostatic charge which is given to the spacer goes down and that is why the patient has to actually replace the uh, spacer uh, every time uh, every now and then depending on the manufacturer recommendations roughly the recommendations are for use for 1 to 3 months some inhalers are uh, useful even beyond that but largely 1 to 3 months is the half life of this particular uh, uh, inhaler with uh, static charge uh so mdi with spacer again the steps how to take prepare the inhaler and load the dose into the spacer uh once that is done breathe out to the maximum keep the mouthpiece uh, of the spacer in the mouth and close the lips around it i have enumerated one step at a time particularly to avoid the confusion then take deep breath through the spacer as far as possible So again, this may differ from the usual manufacturer recommendations, wherein they say that you first put, breathe out, uh, keep the mouthpiece in your mouth, and then actuate uh, the uh, inhaler so that uh, you can inhale. However, again, the problem of coordination is going to come into play and is going to make it less efficacious. So I prefer patients load them, especially the ones who which have got walls in it. So. Uh, the inhalers which we are available to us are with walls without walls with charge without charge so there are so many things to get confused about so we can discuss all these confusing questions uh, if somebody has in mind at the end of presentation then hold uh, after inhaling hold again the breath is as slow as possible and as long as possible then the hold breath for as long as possible at least for 10 seconds and then breathe out normally you need not breathe out forcefully if you breathe out forcefully the next breath you are going to put in less effort because of fatigue so repeat steps 1 to 6 for the second puff then take one puff at a time keep gap of at least 2 minutes for the same reason of mdi uh, charging which is required and gargle with warm water or simple water tap water after second dose not after first dose so you don't have to gargle after uh, each puff you are taking so these are the some of the differences which have been studied if somebody takes inhaler uh, without spacer you can see the amount of deposition in the upper airway and if somebody uses them with spacer you can see there is very negligible amount of deposition in the upper airways and there is good deposition in the lungs and there is even deposition in the lung and not concentrated in the apices only this usually happens because patient starts breathing in when the drug is available uh the entire drug is suddenly sucked into the upper zones and then lower zones actually get the just air without the drugs so to avoid uh, to improve the uniform distribution of the drugs it is always preferable to use with spacer even if somebody says i can master the art of taking inhaler without spacer unless there are genuine reasons for not using spacer uh, i would prefer say, everybody to use inhalers with spacer now that makes uh, inhalers compulsory so that makes uh, metadose inhalers as well less preferred option and that is what the 
uh, the problems are. So these are the advantages and disadvantages again to enumerate. Portable hand with coordination is required to a less extent, though it is still required. Don't tell the patient that hand uh, with coordination is not required. Then they'll start using them haphazardly. Decreased oropharyngeal deposition, uh, as I have told you, and then the disadvantage is the portability goes down and the acceptance goes down little bit. So again, we have to find uh, the uh, another uh, uh, way to circumvent these disadvantages. So we came with breathe actuated inhalers. This simply means that the inhaler starts delivering the drug when the flow generated by the breathing of the patient is sensed by the inhaler. So this is intelligent inhaler. It senses your flows and then delivers the drug whenever your flows are adequate. Wall opens above the predetermined flow and then the dose is delivered. So this is this appears very, very simple. Now I don't have to press, I don't have to use the energy to press the inhaler, and then I don't have to coordinate. So uh, the drug is going nothing, nothing, nowhere else but to the lungs. However, this practically does not happen. This has not improved the deposition beyond usual MDI dose by very great extent, though it has definitely improved uh, to some extent. What are the problems uh, with this inhaler? I'll come to that uh, in, a, uh, in, a, uh, in a while. So breathe actuated inhalers, again, the steps, there are almost 10 steps. Prepare the inhaler by mixing and then open the cap. Once you open the cap, it actually gets ready for delivery. And once you close the cap, it actually counts as one dose delivered. So each time you open and close the cap, I think it counts as one dose delivered. So uh, we'll discuss this from the uh, company point of view. And it also depends on the different uh, uh, manufacturers. Uh, if you want to check whether the dose is delivered or not, you can uh, press on this particular button on the back and you can see uh, the noise which it creates. So that is the noise which actually signifies that the dose is delivered. So for one or two doses, you can do that and then you start using. So breathe out. Then once the, it is mixing is done and the cap is open, you have to breathe out to the maximum like this. Slowly breathe out to the maximum and keep mouth, uh, mouthpiece in, of the inhaler in the mouth and then close lips around it and then start breathing in a slow and steady deep breath. So again, you don't have to uh, rush into the breath because, you have, because if you rush into the breath, even before the drug is delivered, you are filling your lungs with the normal air and when the drug actually is delivered, you don't have any further inspiratory capacity left for the drug to reach to the lungs. So the, our purpose is to uh, take the uh, drug to uh, uh, the lungs. So uh, slow and steady deep breath. A click should be audible at the beginning of the breath. And once that click is there, actually the drug has started delivering. And beyond that, you have to continue taking deep breath as far as possible. Uh, you can actually slow down on the, uh, the speed of breathing, but you still have to continue breathing. This is the most common mistake patients do with breathe actuated inhaler. The moment they get the click, they stop, stop breathing. And then the drug just uh, gets deposited in the mouth and it doesn't reach uh, the lungs where it is intended to. This is one mistake uh, you have to be very, very careful of and check the inhaler technique every time. So hold breathe for as long as possible, mm -hmm. minimum five to 10 seconds. Again, breathe out normally, not forcefully. Close the cap till it uh, uh, clicks back in. This is important to prepare inhaler for the next dose. Repeat the steps one to seven again for the second puff and then gargle with normal tap water again after second dose. So with this, we come to the advantages and disadvantages of the breath actuated inhaler. Some of them I have already highlighted. So these are the advantages and disadvantages. Ultra portable can be carried anywhere, less dependent on, uh, on hand breath coordination. However, the four uh, flows required are slightly higher uh, as compared to the MDI with spacer. So for spacer, the minimum, the flows required are minimum for the MDI with spacer. And the flows required are maximum for the dry powder inhaler. And this comes somewhere in between. Disadvantage is once there is click, patient stops breathing. This is what I was talking about. And it again increases the plastic waste. So with this, we move on to the dry powder inhaler. So dry powder inhalers are nothing but um, uh, uh, inhalers. Uh, which provide uh, the medication in the form of powder. Uh, it is largely uh, active uh, pharmaceutical ingredient is attached to a carrier, uh, usually a lactulose. And once uh, you start uh, breathing in, activation uh, with breathing, the drug and the API starts separating. 
and then the larger carrier particles get deposited in the mouth itself and the finer active pharmaceutical ingredient actually goes to uh, which is less than 10 microns enters the lungs so this is as simple as uh, it goes to so sometimes patients complain that all the powder is actually stuck in the throat and nothing has gone inside the lungs this is how you have to explain them that those particles are not required in the lungs and whatever goes to the lungs you cannot perceive they are very very fine particles and those are the ones which are actually important for your uh, treatment so again coming to the steps of taking dry powder inhaler load the capsule in device rotate the base to open the capsule for rota inhaler this is for rota inhaler uh, again the uh, instructions are different for different manufacturers revolizer you just have to uh, cap it uh, close like this and uh, for other inhalers you have to prick uh, the capsule by uh, puncturing or the pressing the pins which are there at the base then again breathe to the maximum out keep the mouthpiece of the inhaler device in the mouth and the closed lips around it take deep breath through the mouth as fast as possible the here the the keyword is as fast as possible from the beginning itself because the flow required is to the tune of 30 to 120 liters per minute for the uh, effective uh, dispersion of those uh, active pharmaceutical ingredients hold the breath again as long as possible minimum 5 to 10 seconds 10 second is standard and then breathe out normally again not forcefully so the breathing out is always normally and slow that is the only when patients can breathe out completely if they try to breathe out uh, forcefully they will not breathe out uh, to empty the lung or they will not breathe out to the a uh, residual capacity or at least frc that is what we want a uh, gargle with uh, simple tap water within 10 to 15 minutes of using the inhalers so moving on to the advantages and disadvantages once again not highly dependent on coordination these are advantages portable everywhere it can be taken however the disadvantages it requires the ability to generate inspiratory flows to the tune of 30 to 120 liters per minute so those patients who are frail cannot use the powder inhalers dose loading is single step or multi step depends on the manufacturer and the device which you are using for example this is one uh, which is uh, multi dose uh, dry powder inhaler so every company comes with different multi dose dry powder inhaler these are the one single dose dry powder inhaler so rota inhaler and nebulizer are the single dose and uh, uh, sip inhaler is something uh, which is actually uh, multi dose dry powder inhaler so the actuation and the uh, uh, use is different for each of them separate devices do not increase significant plastic waste so again this can be used for 3 to 6 months for if it is functioning nicely especially if it is a single use device if they are multi load the devices then we have to discard them before uh, we can use uh, the subsequent uh, next refill so moving on to the something which is not available but uh, something which i would love uh, for our airway patient uh, disease patients to have is a soft mist inhaler or smr so this the other two companies which are actually manufacturing this uh, not yet available in india this is a near ideal inhaler which is available to us so much so that it may popularize it may popularize inhaled therapy even for non respiratory conditions or non respiratory diseases so if some 10 years 20 years down the line if i come to know that insulin is being delivered by inhalers or antibiotics which are required for treatment of uh say uh, urinary tract infection or meningitis are being delivered by the inhaled uh, route i possibly won't get surprised reason being i understand this device very very well and this actually ensures very good delivery of the drug and uh, this is something which is almost equivalent to giving drugs intravenous uh, uh so the drug levels are achieved very fast uh, especially if we can prepare extra fine particles gives you time uh, to breathe in uh it does not uh, make you hurry like uh, the metadose inhaler so it gives you almost 90 seconds to breathe in uh you can uh, time your breath accordingly effort is not required or at least extra effort is not required whatever the effort is required to breathe in is the effort which is required for uh, taking this inhaler external energy source is not required flow is low so oropharyngeal deposition is again very very low particle size even extra fine is feasible with this particular device so the advantage it combines the advantages of the nebulizers with pressurized metadose inhalers uh, the disadvantage at present is only cost and availability however 
with the kind of audience we have today if everybody starts using this device for especially non respiratory indications i'm pretty sure the cost of the device will come down for our respiratory disease patients also so inhalers coming to the summary how do i choose the inhaler which one is for which patient young motivated patient who can coordinate well the pressurized metadose inhaler especially if he, the travel demands are uh, high for the patient uh for example marketing people who keep traveling from one city to other city they they definitely will forget on some of the accessories they require so they may go with mdi or with actuated inhalers or multi load dry powder inhalers uh any doubt about coordination the emitted dose inhalers especially the ones without uh, zero uh, spacer are not the option can generate adequate flow and requires to travel dpi so multi load dpi or single load dpi are the, uh, the inhaler of choice the frail weak patients who cannot generate uh, adequate flows mdi with spacer is uh, highly preferred over nebulized therapy and nebulized therapy can be considered only as a last resort uh, uh, option once available and the cost comes down the soft mist inhaler is likely to do be, uh, likely to be the first choice inhaler for most of the uh the medications and uh, uh if not fitting into any of the above we can go with nebulizers so with this i uh, thank you all for uh, the patient hearing and uh, uh, with this uh, i uh, uh, stop uh, here uh, we'll take uh, if there are any uh, questions thank you sir thank you for your le uh, nice lecture we hear you very often now but uh, we feel very nice to hear you uh, sir there are no questions so i will request our president madam dr minakshi deshpande to felicitate you no actually this was a very elaborate uh, talks of all the speakers i think that is why there must be no questions and there were at least 117 delegates right till the end and uh, i think that was a very nice uh, cme and webinar which we had today so just one question from my side if any one of the faculties can answer if any asthma i had asked i think dr ashish goel also that after how many days are we supposed to investigate chronic copd for tuberculosis because we as a private practitioner we require to report a suspected tb cases to the or notify them to the government or pmc and then it becomes a problem for us because then at what stage should we recommend that you go in for a tb checkup sputum checkup or uh, any sort of tb checkup cb nat uh hello madam hello uh, yes ha huh? yes so i think there is no definite timeline if the patient is having symptom which is uh, suggestive of uh, tuberculosis like low grade fever especially evening rise of fever then purulent expectoration weight loss if we are thinking that any of such symptoms are there and especially patient is on in a long term inhaled corticosteroids or sometime patient may be taking oral corticoid steroids also then in that case the probability of getting the tuberculosis is more so at uh, that is the time or if there is a new shadow on the x ray then that is the time to investigate the patient for the tuberculosis okay so that is a quite good take home message for all of us and even we can investigate for uh, recurrent um, um, copd or asthma if it is not getting under control that is what you had told in one of the slides yes so if asthma or covid is not under control as i said many of the time it is just the problem with the inhaler technique or hmm. they not be taking it properly otherwise most of the time it should come under control with the proper inhaler technique so in that case we may not have to up regulate or up titrate the treatment just taking the patient for that i always do ask my patient to bring their inhaler on each and every visit and i check it personally it hardly takes you know 30 40 seconds just while talking to the patient we can ask the patient ki aap करून दाखवा तुम्ही कसं इनलर घेत आहे सो मेनी ऑफ द टाइम्स दॅट विल हेल्प ओके सो थँक यू सो आय थँक ऑल द स्पीकर स्पेशल द लास्ट स्पीकर डॉ लक्ष्मीकांत यांगे
i thank you for very well uh, elaborated cme and our lecture talk thank oh, you very thank much you, thank you ma'am thank you yeah and this I is the also yeah. yes ma'am thank and you for and from the secretaries <laughs> Uh, thank you very much. Thank you all the speakers. And we are getting good uh, uh, re yeah. reports. Uh, I mean, uh, feedback, uh, uh, feedback in the chat so session. The, uh, webinar and everyone has got nice, uh, uh, very informative uh, uh, webinar. And everyone waited till the last. So it was a very uh, nicely uh, successful uh, webinar. Thank you very much. And thank you very much all the speakers, all the delegates. And uh, our digital team and Cipla Limited uh, for uh, this uh, for academic grant. So thank you everyone. And I think we'll, we'll be so let us have one more after a few days, after a few months. Thank you. <laughs> thank, you thank you so you. much. Thanks, thank, thank you. you. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. High academic content. Many uh, reporters so they are giving nice reports. <laughs> okay, thank you. Uh, yes. Wonderful webinar. Piyush? Yeah, bye, all of you. Piyush, you can close the webinar now. Yeah, all right, Piyush. Now. Thank you. Uh, are you there, Mr. Piyush? Yes, thank I'm here. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank, thank you so much. Thank you yeah. so much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Very much. Thank you. Thank you, sir.